The small child's first memory was of a celebration taking place among many gods. He was blessed by a crowd of strangers who sincerely admired him, and his father looked at him with a smile. As for the mother, she suddenly threw the small child aside. Her eyes were filled with tears. The girl screamed that she did not want to give birth to such a child. The little girl still barely understood the meaning of the words spoken, that her mother no longer wanted to see her. But deep down, she knew what her screams meant. After this celebration, many discussed that the newborn almost died at the hands of Lady Persephone. After a long time, the girl sat on a tree, near which flowed a river, along which the ferryman Charon was sailing. Climbing down from the tree, the young goddess gave the man the opportunity to notice and greet her. She excitedly rose from the ground and greeted him back, holding a large stick in her hands. The girl ran along with the boat, talking with the carrier that he had been at work since the very morning, to which he replied that there is no schedule for death. Pleased with the answer, the young goddess confirmed his words, but suddenly her gaze fell on the people sitting in the boat. Their faces were full of despair. Some of them shed bitter tears. They did not believe that their end had come. Charon asked her if the god of the underworld, Hades, came into these possessions, to which the girl replied that her father was very busy right now. She then added that it was all because of someone who quit their job to have fun. The man noticed that her mother Persephone needed some time to regain her composure. Trying to change the topic of conversation, the young goddess jumped into the boat and loudly asked if all the dead were fighters and suggested that a war had broken out somewhere. The dead people examined the little girl with interest, and some thought she was very cute, but she did not like it at all, and she told them that they were just talkers who had no commander. The child calmly told them that they should have good physical strength. Then she added that she was most likely mistaken, since they died in the morning and ended up in the underworld. The young goddess stood among the adult dead people and discussed whether they were really such weaklings. The former fighters were very angry at such impudence, and they said that they had no equal on the battlefield. After listening to them, she once again explained to them that, unfortunately, they all died not long ago. The young people became angry and began to draw swords from their sheaths to prove their power to her. One of the warriors swung a sharp sword directly over the head of a small child. The young goddess stopped him with one movement of her finger and told him that everyone in the underworld had been dead for a long time, and how he lived, his honor and so on, were not worth even a stone on the road in this world. The young man could not understand why his body stopped obeying him. The other fighters sitting in the boat also noticed that their bodies were not moving at all. With a bored look, she said that words about glory and power in the underworld are like the barking of a dog. Sailing to the large gate, the young goddess informed them that they would now head to the fields of Asphodel, which were her domain. The young fighters could not utter a word because her magic was still affecting them. Realizing this, the girl snapped her fingers, and at that very moment, the wars were able to control their bodies. They could not contain their joy, which is why they hugged and rejoiced right in front of the young goddess. The bravest of them decided to find out who the little stranger with such power was. She smiled tenderly and announced to them that she was the daughter of death itself, the goddess of resurrection. From time immemorial, goddesses have been mysterious and noble, so wars did not immediately recognize her as a deity. The girl later introduced herself as Rukalis and added that it didn't matter to them. Making an embarrassed face, she explained that lately she had been losing to Thanatos all the time. Spitting on the ground, the young goddess stated that, in her opinion, people have become much weaker. After her story, the girl asked them if they knew how to handle the ball, but the dead still could not move away from her manners. Their idea of the goddess was completely different from what they now saw in front of them. The carrier slowly sailed back, while Rukalis asked the new arrivals who their parents were and how many people they could kill at once. In another part of this world, a messenger approached another goddess with a question about why his mistress began work so early, to which she received the answer that the daughter of death herself instructed her to study the divine bloodline. Having passed the gate to the fields of Asphodel, the young goddess informed her charges that whoever does not obey her will not be fed to Cerberus. One of the warriors told his mistress that he saw a sparkling object in the distance. The girl looked in the indicated direction and explained that this was Elysian, the place where Persephone lived, which she had never been to. In response to their natural question as to why this happened, Rukalis friendlily announced to them that they should not care about this. Persephone was the goddess with whom the king of the underworld, Hades, fell in love at first sight. She was the same goddess who did not give him a single joyful smile. The reason for this was that the girl absolutely never wanted to be with him. Sobbing loudly, she told the god of the underworld that in his kingdom there is a place where only heroes go. Hades, the father of Rukalis, 
knew very well about this place, which was called Elysian. Persephone only prayed to him that he would return someone to her, and no one would ever look for her again. Then she furiously added that his daughter and he himself should not try to find her, because she did not want to see them. The goddess of pain and anxiety, Oisis, said that they should not have given Rukalis any slack, and was worried that the girl was heading to Tartarus, the goddess of discord. Eris tried to convey to her friend Oisis that she was exploring something to follow her. In response, the girl was indignant and said that the daughter of the god of the underworld had never listened to them before. Then they turned for help to the god of eternal darkness, Erebus, who had previously silently listened to their conversation. Initially, all the gods lived in golden palaces, and everyone found their own entertainment. But when Rukalis was born, they all gathered in one place and waited for her. Sitting at the dinner table, Erebus said that at this age, children can behave this way, and Oises explained to him that no god would break skulls and play with Cerberus's knotted tail. An elderly man said that at her age, Hermes stole a herd of cows from Apollo. Another god reasoned that even in comparison with Hermes, this was too much. His words were confirmed by the goddess of pain. Their dialogue was interrupted by a guy who suddenly burst in, asking if they were talking about him. Before them appeared a young man in a helmet with wings, whose name was Hermes, the god of news. The guy happily said that he had dropped by for a while to bring them golden chairs at the request of the daughter of the god of the underworld. Then he pulled out a huge bag behind his back, while the others watched in bewilderment. Hermes told them that the girl personally chose the materials, and it was a small bribe so that they would not fight too much. He added that she put her efforts into it, and the gods admired the new object with delight. Oise said that Tartarus is so deep that even Zeus finds it difficult to cope with some of its inhabitants. She said that they couldn't cut her any slack this time and should give her a good scolding. Heading to a forbidden place, the girl reasoned that the gods should have received her gift. With a satisfied grin, she happily said that the forbidden fruit is always sweet. At this very moment, the young goddess was already in Tartarus, at the very bottom of the underworld, where to send those who angered the gods. Tantalus, Sisyphus, Tedius, Ixion, and other great titans constantly lived in it. There were few inhabitants in Tartarus, and their names could be counted on one hand, but the daughter of the god of the underworld personally knew only a few of them who did not let her inside. One of the residents told her that the goddess Oisis said that a small goddess like her would be torn apart inside with one finger. The girl never paid attention to empty intimidation. It always went in one ear and out the other. Unexpectedly, she met a withered man who plaintively asked her for water. This man was Tantalus, one of the titans, who made soup from his son and served it to the gods, so they cannot stop eating or drinking until death. The young goddess mockingly showed him a water skin and asked if he was very thirsty. The withered titan was incredibly happy about such generosity and stretched out his hands to the water, at the same time thanking the savior. But Rukalis simply threw the life-giving water on the floor because God's punishment is God's, because they are not so supportive as to forgive everyone who challenged them. There was no one in this kingdom who would give him water, but there were much more reckless and great people there. The next point of her campaign was a visit to Sisyphus, whom she asked about his progress. She watched as he tried to lift a heavy, huge boulder up the mountain. This titan deceived Zeus and even the god of death because he wanted to live another life. The girl told him that as soon as he rolled a stone up the mountain, it would immediately roll back down. The guy was doomed to constantly roll a boulder up a mountain that he couldn't stay on. Having watched until the stone rolled down the mountain, the young goddess joyfully announced that she had warned him. The sweaty guy told her that he had already told her many times that this was not a place for little goddesses. In response, the girl said that she had already told him many times that this was a useless matter. Long before this, the god of the underworld sat on the throne, asking Thanatos how man dared to deceive the gods and why he did not control it. The king of the underworld, the god of the afterlife, Hades, looked displeased at his ward. The servant bowed his head and said that he was very ashamed and asked his master to forgive him. Raising his head, he assured God that he was making his promise that such a thing would not happen again. Then he sternly added that the offender would pay in full for trying to deceive the gods. The daughter of Hades watched all this, thinking about why this man challenged the gods. Now she ran after the intruder, whose name was Sisyphus, and asked him why he did not greet her and simply left. As she followed him down the cliff, the girl wondered if he really wanted to take a break. The martyr sadly and calmly answered her that this was the essence of his punishment. Turning to her, the guy was surprised and asked if she really had nothing to do. Rukalis happily answered that she was still very little, 
so she was free to do what she wanted. Sisyphus invited her to go home and do something else, to which he heard in response that this was her home. His head ached from such pressure from the little young goddess, and he covered his face with his hand. He hurriedly turned around and tried to leave her, but the daughter of the god of the underworld stopped him by asking if he was already leaving. Watching the martyr heading towards his place of imprisonment, she began to shout for him to rest a little more. Seeing that this did not stop him, she shouted at the top of her lungs that she liked talking to him. He remembered an incident when, quite by accident, he witnessed how Zeus was torturing a girl. Watching them from behind the rock, Sisyphus could only hear the pitiful pleas of the poor girl. Therefore, now he calmly told the young goddess that all gods are always self-willed. Returning to that terrible day, he remembered how his mother was looking for her daughter Aegina. A woman was crying her eyes out in search of her lost girl when she accidentally saw Sisyphus. The martyr explained to the daughter of Hades that everything will only be as they want. The gods care about people only for show. He remembered how Zeus shouted that his tongue was boneless because he decided to deceive him. Watching the rage of God, the guy heard words that he really decided that people like him were capable of resisting the will of God. Now communicating with the little goddess, Sisyphus explained to her that people like her disgust him. They looked at each other with interest for a long time, without saying a word. Rukalis broke the silence by asking him what specifically he didn't like. The martyr angrily said that he had just told her about this, to which he received a counter-question, does she really not inspire admiration and amaze him? The girl looked at him stoically, and after a while invited him to bow to her. People sacrificed various animals to worship certain gods. The young goddess asked him if he had ever thought about why people kill their livestock. The guy didn't answer her, but only looked away from her to remember the day of his imprisonment. Hades told him that Zeus ordered to deal with him, so he sends him to rot in Tartarus until the end of time. At first the intruder was embarrassed, but then a joyful smile appeared on his face. Returning from his memories, Sisyphus told her that he had never bowed before God, because everything will become a punishment only when a person begins to fear God. The young goddess told him that in this way he would never realize his sin. She then added that you couldn't tell from him that he was just an ordinary person. Turning around, the girl went back, saying that he would tinker with this stone for the rest of his days. Turning sharply to him, she smiled sincerely and said that this was not bad for her. Watching her gradually move away from him, Sisyphus took a deep breath. He scratched his head and said out loud that nothing could be done about the playfulness of children. The girl didn't even think about leaving, so as soon as he started climbing the mountain again, she immediately ran up to him and continued talking. To his questions about the family, the young goddess found many answers that no one would worry about her. Rukalis said that even though Adonis is just a person, her mother is crazy about him. Persephone was in a remote place with her beloved Adonis. Persephone and Adonis were in Elysium, in which little fairies were flying. The lovers lay among the flowers, enjoying each other, because this was the place where valiant heroes ended up. Mother Rukalis gently told him that he was everything to her, in exchange asking what she meant to him. She added that if it weren't for Aphrodite, they could always be together. Sisyphus asked the daughter of Hades how her mother could leave her husband and be different, to which he heard in response that the gods often become attached to the people they like. The martyr replied that this was terrible, and the girl told him not to try to make her understand human feelings. Covering his face with his hand, the guy tried to hide his feelings, and the young goddess shouted that she liked her freedom. He told her that she simply did not understand what loneliness was, and therefore talk about freedom. Looking down on her, Sisyphus explained to her that no one would try to convince her otherwise. After a short pause, the guy added that the reason for this was that she was a goddess. After all, resting in the shade of the trees, leaning on a stump, the girl angrily said that they would look at it later. Hermes approached her, asking if people were right, and she really went to Tartarus. Seeing him, she joyfully rushed to the meeting, asking him if he had brought the golden chairs. Hearing an affirmative answer, the young goddess sat down on a stump and asked how angry they were, but in response, she heard that he did not know. A very tiny one was introduced. Then God knows sarcastically asked her when she would finally grow up. The girl was indignant that she was not tiny at all, but he said that she was quite small. Hermes jokingly added that besides her, only Eros was as small. Usually gods fully develop within a week to a month, but among them there were only two who were unable to grow. This couple was Rukalis and Eros, who constantly competed over which of them had grown up. Eros has golden arrows that can awaken love, and also had lead arrows that awaken hatred. More recently, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, observed Psyche with the help of a magic mirror. She sat on the sofa in the arms of a beautiful man and told him that everyone should open their eyes, 
because she was much more beautiful than the girl in the mirror. Then she called her son Eros, who immediately ran to her with all his speed. The beautiful goddess asked him if he knew where a girl named Psyche lived. Having received an affirmative answer, she asked him to fulfill her mother's little request, to make Psyche fall in love with the most disgusting person in the world. Rukalis remembered that Eros, seeing the girl, drooled and pierced himself with his own arrow. Hermes assured her that the guy was struck by her beauty, to which he heard confirmation from the daughter of Hades. Then God knows briskly asked her what the main point of this story was. The girl suggested that Persephone's beauty was to blame, to which she heard in response that she had misunderstood. He told her that, having gone on his mother's mission, the son of Aphrodite was amazed and fulfilled his plan. Eros, struck by the beauty of Psyche, pierced himself with a golden arrow and immediately grew. Then Hermes sincerely asked if Rahalis knew what made the gods grow. Remembering that story, the young goddess concluded that gods grow when they fall in love. God knows summed up the story by saying that Eros grew up when he fell in love with Psyche, so she too will only grow up when she falls in love with someone. He added that usually the gods immediately understand what love is, hinting that she had no idea about it. The girl became furious and said loudly that she also had an idea about this, and she also had a loved one. Hermes was very surprised by this news and asked her who she was talking about. The young goddess with shining eyes declared that she loved her father with all her heart. Realizing that she did not know the subject of their dialogue, the guy said that it was platonic love. Rukalis joyfully declared that she was going to marry the god of the underworld. Covering his face with his hand, he wished her luck in this, calling her his niece. The girl said that her mother has Adonis, so her father is completely free. Her speech was interrupted by a sharp female voice, causing Hermes and Rukalis to turn around. Oises was heading towards them, making her way through the thickets of bushes and trees, collecting all the holes along the road. Ada's daughter asked why she met her halfway if she received a golden chair. The goddess said that Erebus said that if she did not come right away, he would turn her butt into a trident. The young goddess was seriously afraid of such a fate, and her uncle Hermes only covered his face with his hand. Rukalis screamed loudly, asking why he decided to do this, to which she heard in response that she had gone to Tartarus of her own free will. God knows, he watched as the goddess of pain and anxiety dragged a little girl behind her and said that Erebus was already old and did not seek compromises. Hermes remembered that after his birth, Eros constantly saw his mother having fun with different men, and Rukalis had everything exactly the same. She saw love only in the form of capture and brute force. The daughter of Hades was indignant that, having received a golden chair made by Hephaestus himself, they should all turn a blind eye to her misdeeds. Moving away from them, the guy was still thinking about how people like them knew what love was. At that time, the girl tried to prove to Oises that they really didn't understand, but the goddess was unapproachable. In another part of the world, two novices came to Zeus and told him that they needed to begin preparations. At the same time, Oises decided to lecture the young goddess that the initiation ceremony would take place in a couple of days. The girl plugged her ears with her fingers while the goddess asked her why she even went to where she was asked not to meddle. The woman tearfully told her that she was very worried about her, while Erebus silently watched their conversation. He skillfully pretended not to notice anything and sat shamelessly on the chair that Rukalis had given him. Later, the young goddess complained to the conductor that the older man usually stopped Oisis's scolding, but this time he tactfully did not interfere. In response, he only asked her if this was the reason why she was sailing with him on a boat, to which he received an affirmative answer. Then Karen decided to ask her if he understood correctly that Hephaestus made the golden chairs. The girl calmly stated that since he asked about it, she had something for him too. The conductor blushed with embarrassment, not believing that she had prepared a gift for him too. She added that as soon as they returned, she would show him everything, and he thought that the hereditary owner of gold and jewelry had prepared a gift for him. The man then asked if his gift happened to be gemstone jewelry. The girl, surprised, answered how he could find out about this and offered to swim faster. Hearing her words, Sharon immediately began to row to the shore with lightning speed in order to quickly receive his gift. Enjoying the exciting walk, Rukalis cheerfully said that she owed him a lot during all this time, after which she said that she had instructed him to make something incomparable even to a golden chair. At her words, the guide began to row even harder, which is why the boat almost capsized in the water. Arriving at the shore, the daughter of Hades cheerfully showed him a gift, a new golden boat. The girl said that the whole boat was made of pure gold, and the seats were inlaid with diamonds and gold topazes. Rokalis said there was a figurehead hanging in front of the boat, made in her likeness. Looking at his mysterious face,
the young goddess asked if he liked her idea. Charon imagined that if the dead saw him in rags and on a golden boat, he would not frighten them at all. It seemed to him that many would think that all this looked terribly expensive, thereby causing heated discussions about gold. Seeing how happy she was, the man could not find words to somehow explain his thoughts to her. Having gathered his courage, he said that he was deeply grateful, but he would not be able to use it since the boat was very heavy and would not take away many dead people. Deciding to change the subject, the carrier asked her how their conversation with Hermes went. The young goddess sternly told him that her uncle had told her that she did not know what love was. She clenched her hands into fists and firmly said that she could not agree with this because she was a goddess full of love. The girl loved her father, who senselessly loved his wife, and her mother, who flirted with a man. Rukalis also did not forget about the stupid dead and little fairies, the Titans Tantalus and Sisyphus, as well as Cerberus. Having finished listing all the creatures she knew, the daughter of Hades naively said that she even loved Sharon. The man was slightly puzzled, asking her whether to take her words as a compliment or not. Not hearing his question, the young goddess said that she had said more than once that she hated her mother. She continued to talk about how she is irresponsible and falls for handsome young men. Finishing her thought, the girl said that she did not consider her too bad, but on the contrary, it seemed to her that she had problems with hating her. Having fully told her guess, Rukalis almost beamed and asked if she had convinced him. Then the man asked her if she really didn't remember anything about what happened a couple of years ago. When Psyche came to the underworld several years ago, she said that she had come on behalf of Aphrodite to borrow some beauty from Lady Persephone. The girl met a young goddess who told her that she looked much more beautiful than her mother. The girl was very surprised by the fact that the beautiful stranger wanted to borrow even more beauty. The carrier reminded her that instead of her beauty, Persephone put a deadly dream in the box. The hero of the people, Pirithous, loudly declared that he wanted Persephone to become his wife. Charon said that the lady took this as a mockery, and the daughter Ada said that her mother had victim syndrome. The man said that his big dream was to see her finally become an adult. Rukali said he is talking about it again, but she has known what love is for a long time. Then she heard him say that love is a feeling close to sympathy. The man explained that love is not coercion and control, but the ability to retreat in time. The young goddess asked in surprise, where is the love in this? And then added that he sometimes says two difficult things. At the same time, Thanatos observed a strange picture of many women lying drunk in the middle of the forest. A vein of indignation appeared on his face, and he said out loud that it had suddenly become too quiet. At this time, the girls hugged, sang, and danced, continuing to drink intoxicating drinks. The god of death watched them displeasedly and said to himself that he had done it again. Not forgetting about her charges, the young goddess went to watch the duel. Two young men argued that there was no one who did not know about Erechik of Thracia, and the second answered him so that his opponent would not talk in vain. The girl watched everything that was happening from the side and had a nice conversation with the servant. She was fascinated by the fact that they fought all their lives and even after death continued to swing their swords. The guy asked her who she would bet on this time, to which he heard in response that the daughter of Hades chooses Telsaia. She added that although he didn't show his face, his skills were quite good. Deciding that appearance was very important to her, the servant said that he would bet on the baby of the underworld, the god of death. Thanatos entered the ring, and the young goddess immediately asked why she had not seen him for so long. The girl had already clung to the man who came to them, who told her that he had finally found the culprit. Seeing a golden boat behind her, the guy tiredly lay down inside and closed his eyes. Breaking the silence, he asked if this was the same golden boat, to which he received an affirmative answer. The young goddess told him that the guide had refused her gift, so she carried her to this forest to sit on. Trying to make out the figure on the bow of the boat, the god of death calmly told her that this was sad news, but nothing could be done about it. Leaning higher, he told her that the boat was quite comfortable, to which the girl answered him that she thought so too. He told her that many people were saying that she secretly took away the dead. Rukalis, in turn, denied the rumors and said that she later returned them. Lying on the guy, she continued to listen to the fact that the underworld also has its own orders and laws, so the dead are always transported across the river Styx by Charon on his boat, after which they must appear before God's court. He added that during the trial, all the sins that a person has committed in life are considered, and whether he will receive punishment for them, after which her work begins to return the soul to earth. In response to her assertion that she knew this very well, Thanatos lightly hit her on the head with his fist and said that her behavior spoke absolutely of the opposite. 
The guy reminded her that her initiation ceremony would soon take place on Olympus. Once the girl accepts the powers of resurrection, she will have to perform important work in the underworld. The god of death advised her not to behave like that even as a joke, and she good-naturedly agreed with him. He said that she should not visit Tartarus, to which the girl replied that it suddenly became loud below. Hearing her words, Thanatos quickly realized that the young goddess was trying to change the subject. Looking at her, he saw that Rukalis was not listening to him at all, but was only watching the young girls dancing. She was interested in the question of why so many young girls died in a row. She then asked if they had killed each other because they had feelings for the same man. The guy became very tense at her words, and the girl realized that she shouldn't have asked this question. He told her that this could have happened because of Dionysus. The girls got drunk and drowned in the river. The god of death said ominously that it was difficult to count how many people died drunk. Having let go of the situation, Thanatos sighed heavily and said that it was better not to approach them because these were fans of Dionysus. The girl asked why the girls were called fans, because the servants of the gods are usually called priests. He thought for a while and calmly said that these ladies were lured by Dionysus himself, after which he added that they were caught in his net because of their promiscuity. Rukalis listened to him carefully and quietly summed up his words that they died for fun. She recalled the time when Hermes asked her if she really gave a lift to the dead. The young goddess easily answered that she hoped that she could row an oar as well as Charon. But his words that she scared them very much, the girl said that these illusions also did a lot of bad things. Hermes informed her that even in this case, people need to be loved and cared for. People respected and revered the gods, so often the gods had to look after them. Unexpectedly, Hermes invited her to go to the human world, because there the sun shines, beautiful girls, food and flowers. Rukalis said that in the human world, all good things must come to an end one day, so she liked the underworld, to which he replied that this world could not fill her soul. Every day the gods told her to love and care for others. But, watching the drunken girls, the daughter of Hades realized that the gods were very different from what she thought about them. Getting out of the boat, the god Death told her that the gods are not as ideal as she thinks about them. She remembered the words that they do everything as they want, as they decide, and they care about people only for show. She then told Thanatos that his words were very similar to the words of one of her dead friends. The day of the initiation ceremony arrived, the goddess Oises could not figure out how best to style her hair. The other gods advised her to calm down, to which she replied that it was not something that could be dealt with so easily. She said that since their ward drank Hera's breast milk, this was her first ascent to Olympus, so everything had to be perfect. The god of ridicule mom asked with interest if they were sure that nothing would happen. It was the first time the girl had seen Thanatos dislike something so much. She could not accept the fact that Dionysus kills his fans for fun, because those who worship are given grace, and those who challenge them are punished. She remembered Sisyphus's words that no one would tell her that she was wrong because she was a goddess. The young goddess decided that if she asked Oises or anyone else about this, the Tonys would simply try to hush it up. She decided that such a situation would not suit her, and lost in her thoughts, she did not hear the servants passing by. Rukalis firmly decided that it was worth finding out everything herself from the titan Sisyphus. Two servants followed her and whispered quite loudly. Unable to bear it, she turned in their direction and shouted where they were going, to which she heard in response that they were simply supporting her. When she first met Sisyphus, she found him to be rather ignorant. For a long time she watched him lift the stone up the mountain day by day. The guy quickly got used to her, but never ceased to be surprised that she was visiting him. One day the girl naively asked him how long he would do this. She thought he was ridiculous in his constant repetition of meaningless actions. Rukalis constantly visited him and wondered if all this was worth a simple mockery of the gods. He seemed like a pathetic fool to her when the stone was again at the foot of the mountain. One day, Sisyphus told her that she had a typical behavior for a goddess, to which she replied that, unlike him, she was free. To her question about what he was trying to understand, the guy answered that he was not given the ability to understand the divine essence, so he asked her. At one point, the guy did not finish his sentence, but only laughed loudly and convulsively. The girl watched him with interest, trying to understand if he had finally gone crazy. With joy in his voice, he pointed out to her that the top of the mountain had been worn down after so many years. Covering her eyes with her hand from the sun, the young goddess noticed that the mountain was indeed worn down like a fingernail. The guy said that there was very little left, and he could roll a stone on her. Rukalis looked at him with confusion, trying to understand why he needed this. Sisyphus, always screaming in hopelessness, 
explained to her that he had discovered that it was possible to overcome even divine punishment. Now there was a sparkle in his eyes, and he smiled, telling her that he was not at all afraid of the gods. Returning from Tartarus, the daughter of Hades was indignant and told herself how stupid his face was, and he even hummed to himself. Stopping briefly, she realized that she had long been tormented by the question of why Sisyphus was sent to Tartarus. She saw him very often, but she never once gathered the courage to ask him. Rukalis simply thought in general that this guy had neglected the kindness of the gods. Realizing that she would not be able to find out anything until she met him, the girl decided to question him at the first meeting. Therefore now, heading to a forbidden place, she hoped that he would tell her about Dionysus and about love. The martyr always had something to tell her, which is why she went to him. Arriving at that same mountain, the young goddess did not immediately realize that she could not hear any sounds. She wondered aloud to herself that at ordinary times Tantalus should have appeared before her. The girl realized with horror that she saw absolutely nothing but blackening darkness. After standing for a while, she decided that she had wandered too far, where she had never been before. She thought that if she accidentally went the wrong way, then she should just go back. The daughter of Ada was not looking for new thrills and diligently tried to calm herself down. Seeing a light in the distance, she headed straight towards it, hoping that this was her last hope. Rukalis suddenly heard many voices who thought she was Hades. They quickly changed their minds, sensing the smell of death from the young goddess. The voices said that they had not seen the little young goddesses for a long time and decided that they would have fun with her. A frightening gaze was directed at the little girl from hundreds of empty eye sockets that smelled of death. The young goddess could not move. Tears appeared in her eyes because Anna quickly guessed what kind of creature it was. A long time ago, the grandfather of Zeus, Uranus, saw the Hecatokiris, which Gaia gave birth to. He was horrified to see such ugly creatures screaming for their mother to save them. Grandfather threw them to the bottom of Tartarus. Zeus tried to pull them out to the middle world, but, afraid of the consequences, hid them back again. Now the young goddess begged for help, making a promise into the void that she would never again do dangerous things without permission. She tearfully begged, and said that she would never cross the gates of Tartarus again and would stop making fun of him. Closing her eyes in anticipation of death, the daughter of Hades shed bitter tears and begged at least someone to save her just once. Hearing a strange sound, the girl did not immediately dare to open her eyes, but after controlling herself, she saw her savior in front of her. The young man told her that he would hope that she would keep her promise. The terrible creature asked why he came to them and how he ended up here. Thanatos stood proudly in front of her saying that she always doesn't listen to what others tell her. The creature trembled and constantly repeated that the god of death had come to them, to which the guy told the girl that he would talk to her later. Kneeling and holding her hands up, daughter Ada listened attentively as she was scolded by her savior, who said that she had been told more than once not to go to a forbidden place. He was angry and shouted loudly that she could not imagine what would have happened to her if he had not decided to check if she had really gone there. The guy kept saying that she had no idea how worried everyone was. Concluding his speech, he added that from now on, she was prohibited from entering Tartarus, as well as from going somewhere without permission and causing mischief. The girl tried to challenge him, but the savior threateningly interrupted her attempt and asked whether she understood him or not. Rukalis again tried to contradict him, but came to her senses in time and decided to submit to fate. The young goddess bowed her head, asked him for forgiveness, and said that she understood everything. Calmed down by her humble answer, the guy sighed heavily, trying to believe that she really wouldn't do something like that again. When he saved her, the god of death told the creature that the little goddess was the daughter of Hades. Hecaton Cherries could anger the god of the underworld and thereby get stuck in Tartarus forever. The creature chanted menacingly that he was telling a lie and they did not believe him at all. They loudly asked how the daughter of the god of the underworld could end up in Tartarus. The savior calmly told the girl that this seemed strange not only to him, but even to a creature from the very bottom of Tartarus. Taking out his sword, he asked if they really thought that he intended to lie to them. Cutting them with his sword, the god of death looked at them cruelly and informed them that they would regret their words. Being safe, he told the young goddess that although it ended well, she should try to be more responsible in the future. He added that everyone was very scared, and Oises clung to his clothes so much that she tore them. Taking three feathers out of his pocket, the guy showed them to the girl and said that the goddess also pulled them out. The guy announced importantly that now she knows that she shouldn't do rash things. She decided to herself that she needed to stop going to the forbidden place for a while because she had never seen Thanatos so angry before. The girl stopped listening to him, thinking only that she would first be obedient. 
Rising from the ground, the god of death called her so that the young goddess would take an oath to him. He calmly explained to her that it was necessary to take an oath at the river Styx, to which Rukalis widened her eyes. Noticing the change in her face, Thanatos mockingly asked if she really thought that she would just cry, and that would be the end of it. Heading to the river, he talked about how this oath cannot be broken, otherwise the culprit will fall asleep for nine years, after which he will be expelled from Olympus for nine years. After the story, he took her to the river and made her swear that she would not enter Tartarus again. The young goddess asked him how she would fulfill her divine duty if she could not enter the forbidden place, to which he replied that when she grew up, it would not matter to her. She loudly declared that if something happened in the underworld, she would have no choice but to enter Tartarus. The guy said that if this happens, then of course she will be able to enter the forbidden place. Looking at her angrily, he sternly said that such an incident was unlikely to ever happen. Having resigned herself to the inevitable, the girl obediently headed towards the river, under the joyful supervision of her savior. After the oath, the young goddess went to her place, where in the morning she was surrounded by goddesses. It seemed to them that there was something wrong with the face of the daughter of Hades. Oises said that she had lost weight, and the others thought that she was swollen. Since the day Rukalis was born, not a single day had passed when they had the opportunity to rest a little. Eris said that she was told that the girl met fans of Dionysus. All three decided that their little lady had taken part in one of the festivities. Another god approached them and told them that the festivals of Dionysus were famous for their madness. His followers either went mad en masse or became pigs in the slaughterhouse, the god of dreams. Oniros added that there was nowhere to put this madness, but someone noticed that his followers were again having terrible fun in their dreams. Oises agreed, and Eris reasoned that he lived for so long, but never became normal. The guy understood that the lower gods died of madness, and although he was above this, he was amused by the very fact of such a thing. In dreams, everyone runs away from a boring life in which they only want to die, because this was the only entertainment. Sometimes dreams did not bring the desired relaxation, but on the contrary, frightened me even more. The god of dreams often watched people wake up in horror in the middle of the night, not understanding how they could dream such a thing. He used to enjoy the screams of people waking up from nightmares, but now he was tired of that too. Even among the highest gods, those who really knew how to have fun could be counted on one hand, including Zeus, who scatters seeds everywhere, and Artemis, who destroys animals. The god of dreams counted himself among them, believing that he was worse than military tacticians who incited people to battle. The immortality of the body does not help keep God sane. So many people die due to the fault of the deity. Oneros continued to live because he could not die. He lived a life in which he gave up, but could not stop it. His thoughts were interrupted by Oises, who shouted for him to come to her as soon as possible. At the end of all this, he met the very young daughter of Hades, who looked at him with genuine interest. Oises introduced her to Rukalis and said that she was a real cutie and that the god of the underworld himself had entrusted her to them. He remembered the day when the girl learned to walk well, and Eris offered to take her on a plane ride. A recently croaking child learned to move so quickly after a few days that no one could keep up with him. In worries, several years flashed by in one moment. The god of dreams was equally afraid of this, and at the same time was glad. Now, sitting by her bed, he reasoned that when she grew up, the immortal body would also absorb her fragile soul, and for her, there would be a future as uninteresting as a white ceiling. Erebus approached him, put his hand on his shoulder, and calmly said that all children grow up, and they cannot go against the flow of time. Then he pulled the young goddess by the cheek, and added that their little mischief-maker could not live without knowing the world outside the underworld. Oneros confirmed his words, but clarified that he would like her to stay with them longer. After the incident in Tartarus, the tutelage of the gods only intensified, so Oises declared that she would walk with her all day long. Eris suggested another option, to put a wiretap on the little street child. The girl listened in horror to how they wanted to allow her to go out only once a month. Unable to withstand the pressure, Rukalis attempted to escape from her guardians. The daughter of Hades immediately hid in the reeds near the river Styx, while everyone else frantically tried to find her. She whispered that her nannies were crazy, because she already lived a monotonous life. She was watched by the reed fairies, who sincerely did not understand why she was constantly hiding in their possessions. The girl's gaze fell on the handsome young man, and the first thing she thought was that he was a narcissist, but then she remembered that then he would have had lilac hair. The guy turned his gaze to the girl sitting in the reeds, which greatly embarrassed her. Realizing that she had already given herself away, 
Rukalis headed straight towards him, trying to justify her behavior. Coming closer to him, the daughter of Hades blurted out with lightning speed that, in her opinion, he was very handsome. She greatly confused the stranger, causing him to begin to stumble over his own words. Having controlled himself, the blonde guy told her that this was praise for him from the goddess herself. The young goddess told him that she had not seen any dead people like him nearby, and also asked how he knew who she was. It suddenly dawned on her that the name that had come up in the conversation about Persephone contained golden shiny hair and light eyes the color of the sea. The girl sternly said that there is only one person from whom the smell of a living person emanates. After carefully examining him, she thoughtfully asked if he was really the same Adonis. The guy smiled affectionately and joyfully greeted the goddess standing in front of him. Adonis is the favorite concubine of Persephone and Beauties, whom Aphrodite cherishes. The goddess of beauty turned to the god of the underworld so that he would allow her to be with Adonis. She said that even if he died, she could breathe life into him. Her request was interrupted by Persephone herself, who brazenly pushed her to the side right in front of Hades. The mother of the goddess of rebirth screamed that Adonis was already dead, so she asked not to take away her only joy. Before the god of the underworld, a serious discussion began about what to do with the life of the unfortunate guy. Aphrodite grabbed Persephone by the hair, saying that if Hades had not been there, she would have destroyed her long ago. After some time, the god of the underworld informed them that the guy would live for six months on Earth and the remaining six months in the underworld. In their world, Adonis was widely known as the man who was able to capture the hearts of two goddesses at will. Under the cover of darkness, the object of contention tempts Persephone with his sweet speeches. Now, standing in front of the little goddess, he said that she had probably heard many rumors about him, so he asked her to beat him heartily. The girl thought that the guy standing in front of her was completely far from the rumors that were hovering around him. She did not believe that the guy could capture the hearts of two goddesses just with his cute face. The young goddess explained to him that she had no reason to beat him because this was the first time they had met him. She noted to herself that she imagined him as a vile seducer, judging by the fact that he was called the one who plays with two goddesses. Rukalis always thought that at the first meeting she would immediately curse him she wanted to slap him in the face or slap him on the head. But at the moment, the only daughter of Hades realized that the rumor really could not be trusted. Walking with a guy along the river, she asked him why he was wandering alone in the underworld, to which she heard in response that he just wanted to look at this kingdom. He added that he did not have much time left before returning to the kingdom of the living. The girl asked him where he had been in the underworld for such a short time. Adonis told her that when he left Elysian, he first went to the river, the young goddess could not believe that for so many years in the underworld, he had only seen Elysian and the river Styx. She said that she had heard that her mother would not let him go for a second, but she never thought that it would be to this extent. The girl told him that there was so much to see in the underworld. Having completely drooped, Rukalis quietly said that it could not be that he had not seen either the Golden Palace or Cerberus, and had not even tried to play taking ribs out of skeletons. Adonis told her that, albeit a little, she talked to him. From his words, the young goddess thought that his manners were very good, and he seemed much better than she thought. The guy tried to ask her something, but he didn't know where to start. The daughter of Hades took matters into her own hands and tactfully asked if she understood correctly that this was his first time going out. She held out her hand to him and said that she would show him all the places of the underground kingdom especially for him. Sitting in the boat, the girl told him about the light the only entrance connecting the world of the living and the kingdom of the dead, which was located on Cape Tanneron in the Sparta region. Then she talked about how if you go up the River of Souls, you can see the golden palace of the goddess Styx, after which she reported that by sailing a little more by boat, you can get to the Supreme Court and even see Cerberus there. Charon interrupted her story about the kingdom of the dead, asking who her companion was. He looked at them sternly and said that after the incident with Orpheus, he did not carry living people on his boat. The carrier was punished because, succumbing to the music of Orpheus, he gave him a ride on a boat. The young goddess joyfully announced to him that he knew her companion very well, because it was Adonis. The man looked carefully at the stranger and asked if this was the Adonis he knew. Sharon suddenly became worried and asked her to tell him that he had simply heard incorrectly. The embarrassed girl said that he was the same guy with whom her mother had a close relationship. Rokalis added that the guy turned out to be much kinder than she imagined. She mockingly said that her new acquaintance constantly called her a goddess. Examining the guy from head to toe, the man realized how handsome the two goddesses could not share, 
cherishing him because he shared the bed with them and made them happy. Watching the pleased young goddess, Charon decided that since he was able to go to bed with two goddesses, he knew exactly how to treat the opposite sex. His thoughts were interrupted by a loud crack of wood, and he woke up to see a broken oar in his hands. When the daughter of Hades asked why this happened, he answered that she had been old for a long time. Rokala suggested that he replace the oar with a new golden oar, and then decided to tell this wonderful story to her new acquaintance. The carrier continued to watch the children, thinking that it was always difficult because of Persephone. After waiting until they had finished talking, he asked if the girl had really brought Adonis without permission, because her mother obviously would not have approved of this. The young goddess laughed maliciously, telling him that she was not a fool, but suddenly realized the seriousness of the situation. Jumping up in the boat, Ada's daughter said that she knew that he could be brought to the river. She then reasoned about how they needed to get him back in time, but then asked why her mother let him go. Greatly worried about her situation, Rukalis anxiously asked Adonis about who he had gone for a walk with. The surprised blonde guy told her that he left Elysian alone. After this, he unexpectedly added that he had to wait by the river until the goddess gathered. Smiling sweetly, Adonis told them that he was thinking about what Lady Persephone allowed them to do. The girl began to frantically scream that he knew perfectly well what kind of relationship they had, so her mother could not allow her to do this. Trying to calm down, the young goddess reasoned that their excursion was a failure because the goddess would not leave it like that. Her daring was interrupted by the confident voice of a guy who asked her not to worry too much. He said that the lady now regrets rather than hates her, so she does not come close. Then he calmly added that if he talked to her, her mother would definitely understand everything. In response to this statement, Rukalis grabbed the boat and laughed heartily. The guy looked at her in surprise and did not understand at all why she had such a reaction. Wiping the tears from her eyes that arose from laughter, the young goddess asked again if she was not approaching because she was sorry. Leaning closer to Adonis, she asked with a mysterious look if he really thought so. Persephone's lover remembered well how tears flowed every night before going to bed. She said that she never wanted this and that everything around her was not what she craved. Then she fell powerlessly and asked herself what to do. He remembered that goddess who shed so many tears because she could not love her daughter. Now the guy sincerely did not understand how the one who had previously been so vulnerable in front of him now turned out to be very cruel. Persephone furiously squeezed Rukalis's throat with her hands, so tightly that the poor girl could only grunt. Daughter Ada always thought that it was very difficult for her mother, because on her birthday, she wanted to throw her little daughter into the river. The little goddess thought that she would never forget this wild desire to kill her and her words. A few minutes before her mother grabbed her, the girl was sitting in a boat and told her companion that she really liked him, because he was savvy and listened to her enthusiastically and also handsome. She then added that she wanted him to stop saying inappropriate things and for her to see each other more often. As they approached the shore, they heard many voices of little fairies calling out to them. After they went ashore, the fairies began to carefully examine Adonis, simultaneously asking him if he was injured. A furious Persephone emerged from the thicket and was greeted by her daughter, saying that they had not seen each other for many years. The goddess suddenly raised her hand, looked angrily at Rukalis, and called her a little bug. Then her hand hit the daughter of Hades's cheek with all her might, but the girl didn't even try to move away. She wanted the guy to see everything with his own eyes, so she didn't stop her mother from beating her. Persephone grabbed the little goddess by the clothes and cried out that she and Hades were very similar. The goddess added that the girl does the same thing. When she likes someone, she tries to get her hands on it. Continue talking about how if something wants to leave, then he and his father forcibly tie him to themselves, at the same time remembering their conversation with Hades. One day he asked her if she liked freedom of movement, to which she thought that he was just making fun of her. She was abruptly interrupted by Karen coming up from behind, who gently took her by the shoulders and said that the lady must save her face. He added that many people were watching her actions. These words made Persephone look around. Next to them stood many fairies and her beloved Adonis, who carefully watched everything that was happening. Pushing her daughter away from her into the hands of the carrier, the goddess went to the guy, asking if he was hurt. Approaching him, she hugged him tightly, so that the subject of the quarrel could barely tell her that everything was fine with him. At the same time, the little goddess told Charon to leave, to which he noticed that her condition was very serious. But she replied that she was fine, and he needed to get back to work. Turning towards the goddess and her lover, the girl realized that the guy would be speechless. Persephone violently shook his shoulders and screamed his name loudly, trying to bring him to his senses. Seeing that everything was all right with him, she held out her hand to him and invited him to go back. 
Rukalis, watching everything, gently rubbed the sight of the impact and could not believe that they just up and left. Then she thought about how she hadn't predicted that her mother would slap her, and that being possessed by goddesses was very frightening. The procession was closed by two fairies, who openly whispered to each other about what had happened. The daughter of Hades stood not very far away and could clearly hear their conversation, from which rage boiled up in her. Raising her finger up, the girl sent divine punishment to one of them, causing the fairy to fly into the air. Those leaving turned to see what had happened, and the little goddess asked the fairy if she really believed that a princess would never appear next to the queen of the underworld. The fairy in agony tried to justify herself while the magic squeezed her throat more and more. The next second, the unfortunate woman's wings began to gradually evaporate before her eyes. Unable to hold herself in the air without wings, she began to fall to the ground with lightning speed. Falling to the ground, she heard the little goddess seriously ask whether she was really just a target for fairy's ridicule. The girl added that it could not be that she did not know that even next to Persephone, she could not escape punishment for offending the goddess. She began to step on the fallen fairy's hand as she tearfully begged her for forgiveness. Rukalis furiously informed her not to be so arrogant in the future, enlisting the protection of her mother, and also that people like her disgusted her. While she was speaking, Persephone, Adonis, and their retinue gradually moved away from view, oblivious to what had happened. The god of death was the first to see that the face of the little goddess showed the blow of a slap. In response to his silent question, the analysis spread her hands and asked him who else he thought could hit her in the face. Realizing that nothing could be fixed, he covered his face with his hand and offered to anoint the area of the blow with ointment. In response to her negative response, Thanatos, with irritation in his voice, told her not to persist. The girl grabbed her hair, looked away, and said that she didn't want to appear like that in front of everyone. Then, realizing his words, Rukalis angrily asked if he was trying to take care of her. Without waiting for an answer, she turned around and headed home, and the god of death told her to return to the palace when everything was healed. After saying goodbye to him, she went outside, but thought to herself that she would also hit her mother. In front of her father's office, there was a sofa on which two men sat, half asleep. The girl lay on their feet from behind and asked a rhetorical question about whether they knew who was born simply because he wanted to, or whether they knew about someone who could not hit because he had no hands. In the reception room of the royal palace, there is a chair of oblivion that makes you forget everything. One of the men was the earthly king Perithius, who confessed his love to Persephone. The other was Theseus, who was the hero and friend of Perithius, and both of them could not help but utter a word. Rukhalis continued her tirade about how she didn't hold back because she didn't want to upset her father. Then she questioned how they could possibly like her. Poking her foot in Theseus's face, she informed them that their people were in complete chaos, but they were like punching bags. Oises often asked herself the question of whether she really knew everything that was happening in the soul of the little goddess. Therefore, seeing her now, she was shocked at how her ward had grown, and asked if she remembered the rules of etiquette for a newcomer and the genealogy of the gods they had studied. Watching everything that was happening, the god Oneros wiped away his tears, and the goddess Eris laughed joyfully. The goddess of pain squeezed the little goddess tightly and told her not to forget what they taught her and to always be close to Hermes. Oises shook her vigorously to bring her to her senses and tried to find out whether her charge understood everything. Rukalis finally realized the seriousness of the fact that she had to ascend to Olympus. The day of her ascension came, and all her thoughts were that everyone was seeing her off to war. Freed from the confinement of the goddess of pain, the girl headed away from them, listening to the fact that after the ceremony, she would definitely come to them and not forget them. She couldn't understand why everyone was so nervous, because it wasn't them who had to go to Zeus. Remembering the god of dreams who burst into tears, the daughter of Hades decided that he was just old, which is why she shed a few tears. Approaching the carriage, the girl was indignant at being looked after too much. She did not like her new colorful dress, which was personally selected by the goddess Oises. As she walked through the thicket, her only thought was that when she returned, she would return the favor to her overseers. The god of death had been waiting for her near the carriage for quite a long time, and seeing her, asked why she was so late. Rukhalis was very glad to see her old acquaintance, who was the only one who did not treat her departure with trepidation. His face expressed complete calm, but still politely asked what happened to her and why she didn't come out earlier. Making a greeting bow to him, the girl said that it was all her guardian's fault. Before she could finish speaking, she immediately found herself inside the carriage, thanks to the actions of Thanatos. She was worried about why there was so much noise around them. 
she believed that everyone wanted to see her. The guy quickly brought her back to Earth, telling her that if this were so, they would have met her as she approached, and added that she should not build empty hopes. The noise outside the carriage intensified, which made the little goddess even more interested. Looking out of the carriage, she saw her mother and resignedly asked why she was here. The girl said out loud that once was enough for her, and then asked why they see her so often. She then turned to Thanatos with the question of why someone who had never blessed her was here. Noticing the bewilderment on her friend's face, Ada's daughter asked if she was hallucinating. Without waiting for an answer, she assumed that Persephone could not have come to the carriage alone. Rukalis continued to watch, thinking that her mother must have taken Adonis with her. A picture of her mother's endless love for the young guy appeared before her eyes. The young goddess decided that all this was so that she would pay attention to them, because the last time they had a fight was precisely because of this. She recalled how she tore the fairy's wings and believed that she had also made a mistake that day. The girl laughed loudly and told Thanatos that she had hated her father for so many hundreds of years and asked why she was paying attention to herself right now. Without listening to her speech, Thanatos covered her eyes with his hand, but did not take into account the fact that she managed to see everything. Rukalis witnessed the passionate kiss of Persephone and Adonis, which is why she got out of the carriage. The god of death tried to stop her, and the daughter of Hades wondered if they were really using the tongue, because there was a rumor that this method rejuvenates. Many fairies blushed at what they saw and sighed that this was a kiss with a handsome young man, while Thanatos, meanwhile, tried to convince the young goddess not to look in their direction. The girl continued to watch, saying that this is how Adonis attracts goddesses, and later concluded that she also wants the handsome man for herself. A few moments later, they heard the sound of horses, wondering who else might be joining them. Raising her head up, she saw a beautiful golden carriage and began to remember the genealogy of the gods. From Oisis's lessons, she knew that the flowing blonde hair and the reliefs of white swans belonged to only one goddess. And this goddess was none other than Aphrodite, who came to the underworld to take her lover. The girl was stunned by such luxury and beauty of one of the great goddesses of Olympus. Having landed, the goddess first of all began to hug Adonis, whom she had not seen for a very long time. Rukalis quickly realized that people were there to see Aphrodite, not her. The newcomer told her lover that she had missed him all these six months. Immediately after her words came a long-awaited kiss, from which everyone froze in amazement. Suddenly, many flowers appeared around, to which the young goddess thought about where in the underworld the flowers could come from. Remembering that her mother had been with Adonis before, the girl turned her gaze to her. Persephone was blacker than a cloud, to which the young goddess noticed that she was completely furious. Thanatos was still of the opinion that it was better for the daughter of Hades not to see all these scenes. He covered her face with his hand again, telling her that it was better not for children to see such a sight. Taking his hand away from her, the girl became furious and asked where he saw the children here, because from birth she had a wide knowledge of human thoughts and the sight was pleasing to her eyes. With an exclamation that goddesses do not lose, she savagely bit his finger, to which the god of death remarked that she was not a goddess, but an animal, since he liked it that way. Their fight was interrupted by the sweet voice of Aphrodite, inviting Adonis to go to Olympus. Rukalis remembered that she needed to greet the great goddess, so without hesitation, she headed towards her. Having bowed in greeting, the girl introduced herself, to which the goddess in response asked her if she was really the daughter of the king of the underworld himself. Hearing an affirmative answer, Aphrodite apologized for such explicit scenes and added that she had been separated from her lover for a long time. The girl could not believe how, even in embarrassment, the goddess was full of love, saying that she had seen Rukalis when she was very young, so she did not know how much she had grown. Then she approached the young goddess and affectionately said that she had heard that she would ascend Olympus today, after which she wished her to become a great follower of Hades. The young goddess could only think that she had been kissed by the most beautiful goddess in the world, so she decided that she would no longer wash her face and that she would definitely tell Hermes about it. Then the goddess whispered that the girl's dress suited her very well, to which she received words of gratitude in response. Turning towards Adonis, Rukalis noticed how intently he was looking at them. Her train of thoughts was interrupted by Hades approaching, to whom the girl immediately ran, and the goddess of beauty said that they had not seen him for a long time. Aphrodite asked him why he was almost invisible, and then added that she knew that he did not like to go out and advised him to look at Olympus more often. The king of the underworld smiled slyly and calmly promised her to try his best. The goddess was pleased with his answer, smiled, and said that in that case, she would go first. Hades took his daughter in his arms 
and together they politely waved to the carriage driving away from them. They watched for a long time as the carriage of the goddess of beauty herself disappeared into the distance. Thanatos immediately appeared behind them, informing them that it was time for them to leave too. To his request that the young goddess not cause an accident, Rukalis answered with annoyance that nothing like that would happen. The outside world is full of bright colors. The same sky has hundreds of colors, so the girl constantly tried to climb out the window. Her eyes had never seen such beauty that no words could describe. He affectionately named his daughter Rue. The father was interested in what impression she had of the world that Hermes told her about. To her answer that everything was much more beautiful than she had imagined, the god of the underworld smiled contentedly. The joyful daughter told him that she was so delighted with such beauty that it was difficult for her to sit still. When Persephone kissed Adonis, Rukalis was glad that her father was not there, but in her heart she understood that he was late on purpose. She reasoned that he knew everything about his mother and was definitely aware that today was the day she said goodbye to her lover. The girl remembered her mother's words that they should entrust Elysian to her and never try to find her again. From the moment she heard Persephone's request not to look for her, there was always one question in her heart that she kept secret. It seemed to the young goddess that if she had not looked like her father and had not been her mother's daughter, Hades would have loved her. She then decided that this was a stupid question, because even if she was like Persephone, her mother would still not love her. Even if she looked like her in appearance, there was always the fact that the girl was the child of a person she did not love. Sitting in the carriage, Rukalis thought that nothing would ever change, but she still believed that if she were more like her mother, her father would love her more. She had long wanted to ask, many were always scared, because there was always the option that her father would answer her that they didn't love her. Noticing her sad look, Hades gently hugged his daughter by the shoulder and announced that it was time to go for a walk, which greatly reassured her. At the same time, the god of war was resting on a mountain of still warm corpses that had fallen during a recent battle, thinking that the day had come when he could kill the insolent man. Unbridled fun reigned on Olympus. Almost all the gods drank intoxicating drinks. Observing everything that was happening, the arriving young goddess, who was immediately doused with a drink, thought that the ceremony should be a more formal celebration. Unlike her expectations, Olympus turned out to be free, and the flowers were colorful and beautiful like precious stones. She thought that there was nothing more beautiful than the jewels found in the underground world. The main god Zeus immediately took her on his lap and said that when he first saw her, she fit in his one hand, and now she has grown significantly. Then he added that once upon a time Eros was as small as her, but now he has become disgusting. The girl carefully watched the gods who were there, while Zeus asked her about what she thought when she first visited Olympus. Seeing Hermes wink, Rukalis changed her face and replied that Olympus is beautiful. Then Zeus mysteriously asked her if she knew what her task as the goddess of resurrection was. It seemed to her that he was conducting a test for her, so the young goddess dryly replied that she knew her duties. She added that her main task is to return to the surface those who accidentally ended up in the other world. Her second task was to breathe life into what had lost its strength in winter in the spring. And the last mission was that she must tie the thread of fate to those who atoned for their sins in the underworld. Remembering the special guest Tantalus, the girl added that she should allow them to be reborn. Zeus was very pleased that she knew her main duties perfectly and said that she was indeed the daughter of Hades. He humbled his ardor and said in a calm voice that there was one more important matter for her. Approaching her closer, he quietly informed her that she had the power to resurrect the dead. Then Zeus said that not a single god of Olympus, not even the highest god like him, could do this. All living things have threads of fate that are tied to them by three goddesses of fate. The most indestructible of them is the thread of life. Rukala said, puzzled, that she had no plans to interfere in the life and death of people. She added that she does not attach much importance to death at all, because only the place of residence of people changes from the outside world to the underground. Zeus looked at her with interest and concluded that this is why she does not go beyond the underworld. Patting her on the head, he joyfully told her to do what she thought was right. The main god told her that her words calmed him, but many gods did not think so. He suggested considering Aphrodite as an example, who, after the death of her beloved Adonis, shares him with another. Zeus added that now, at every meeting with the young goddess, she will beg for the resurrection of the guy. The girl confirmed his words, saying that Adonis smells more like a dead man, to which God stated that this is so because vitality has its own limit. He calmly explained that the subject of their dispute and those who once knew him were long dead. Then Zeus added that even if the guy unexpectedly resurrects, 
this will not disrupt the course of life. Everyone understood perfectly well that in the event of resurrection, Aphrodite would always be next to the unfortunate man. Accordingly, Persephone, as soon as she learned this news, would immediately go crazy from the hopelessness of the situation. The main god said that he still has many requests, but since he is the head, he cannot voice them all. Letting go of her head, he asked the girl if she remembered that those who disrupt the course of life end up in Tartarus. The young goddess immediately remembered that terrible creature who constantly screamed that a little goddess had come to them, smelling of death. Having calmed down, Rukalis smiled welcomingly and said that she knew about this better than anyone. Zeus suddenly began to lift her from her knees, saying that ordinary gods would not interfere with her. Lowering it in front of him, he announced the beginning of the initiation ceremony for the new goddess and wished her to always make wise choices. Now she could see what was hidden behind the gaze of the many gods who were present at her ceremony. The main god enthusiastically said that in the name of the supreme god Zeus, he names Rukalis, the daughter of Hades and the princess of the underworld, the goddess of resurrection. The girl saw thirst and passion in the faces of those present. She understood what would be a benefit for them and what would be a loss. Aphrodite mysteriously called the young goddess to her and asked her to come to her when everything was over. Rukalis understood that this is exactly what I wanted to tell Zeus, that the great and beautiful Olympus is full of darkness and secrets. But feeling a surge of strength, the daughter of Ada firmly decided that she could cope with everything. After the ceremony, Hermes approached her and asked if Olympus was better than she thought or not, to which she replied that this place deserved to be seen one day. God knows that he perfectly saw how she admired the flowers, to which the girl explained that they were more graceful than those that grow in the underground kingdom. The guy laughed and told her that she was always so stubborn, to which Rukala said that the celebration was very different from what she had imagined. Hermes was sincerely surprised by her words, pretending that he did not understand at all that she was talking about how much the local inhabitants were liberated. Even the main god did not deny himself the pleasure of carnal pleasures. The guy said that in Olympus, everyone is more open than in the underworld. He then added with a sigh that the god of death had the exact same reaction as her. The girl could not believe his words, asking whether her friend was really having so much fun, because all this time she considered him a eunuch. Hermes said that he reluctantly drank a couple of glasses and left, just like Hades once did. The guy suggested that the gods of the underworld are more sensible than other male gods, so there are rumors that they are all boring. She said that she had never actually seen Thanatos even lay a hand on a woman. Listening to the story, the god of news suddenly grabbed a maid passing by and said that it was quite difficult for the god of death because he did not know what real pleasure was. The girl tried to escape from his embrace, but God had absolutely no intention of giving in to her. He seductively began to ask her if she really didn't like his actions, because before that, he saw how she watched everything from the side. A sharp kick from Rakalis brought him back to his senses, after which the girl asked if he really didn't understand the words. Still angry with him, the daughter of Hades said that the girl made it clear that she did not want anything, and even if he was a god, this did not give him the right to act like that. Turning to the poor maid, she added with relief that she would scold him separately. The girl hurried away, angrily uttering words of gratitude through her teeth. Hermes laughed embarrassedly and asked what he should do if she continued to interfere in his affairs. The young goddess did not understand anything. She was especially interested in the girl's strange reaction and her friend's mockery. Sitting in the corridor of Olympus, the goddess of resurrection loudly argued that Thanatos deserves to be only in the underworld. She suddenly remembered that she was supposed to meet the goddess of beauty. Aphrodite. Sitting on the stone floor, the daughter of Hades understood that she absolutely did not want to get involved in the showdown between the goddesses. Rising to her feet, she firmly decided that the goddesses were not escaping and headed towards Aphrodite's bedroom. Once upon a time, she heard from a fairy that on the day when Adonis was supposed to return to Olympus, Persephone chained him out of fear. Therefore, now it seemed to her that Aphrodite would do the same with her lover. The girl decided that she would take a look at everything with one eye and if something happened, she would help him escape. Walking further into the room, she didn't understand where everyone had gone, and at the same time, she thought about why he was born so handsome in the first place. As she walked closer to the bed, Rukalis noticed the clothes lying on the floor, and then realized how stupid she had been. She saw Aphrodite and Adonis making love, which made her aware of the fact that the goddess was not angry with him. The goddess of resurrection received confirmation that the guy, on the contrary, is now diligently receiving praise. Leaving the room, she headed further down the corridor, 
reasoning that she should not be like the actions of fairies or Adonis, because it would only be to her detriment. As she walked past the large pillars, the young goddess wondered out loud whether she should go drink the nectar. A stranger called out to her, asking if she was the same goddess of resurrection, and rudely remarked that she was even smaller than he thought. Turning around, the girl saw in front of her a guy with red hair and a savage posture. Only one person can exude such a strong smell of blood, so she bowed to him in greeting, because before her was the god of war Ares. The stranger turned out to be Aphrodite's first love, who continued to say that he had never heard of her being deaf before. There was a lot of information about the goddess of beauty, Aphrodite, as she was constantly surrounded by men. Due to the fact that she disliked the appearance of her husband Hephaestus, she shared her love with many. Her most famous lover was her husband's younger brother, the god of war Ares. They were not shy about anyone and never tried to hide their love from anyone on Olympus. Ares is the primary god, the patron of war, who, together with Athena, helped replenish the population of the underworld. The young goddess constantly thought about when they would meet him, but she could not even imagine that it would happen exactly like this. There was only one reason in the whole world why he could search for her so frantically. He told her that his beloved would ask her to resurrect Adonis, because she dreams of the guy being resurrected. Once upon a time, he turned into a wild boar and killed the object of desire of the goddess of beauty. Now he demanded that the young goddess be resurrected and that she under no circumstances fulfill her request. He added that even if Aphrodite constantly breathed life into him, there would still be a limit to it someday. Ari said that the dead man would not be able to resist his fate forever and continue to rush between Olympus and the underworld. As he left, he said that if Adonis got stuck in the underworld, it would be much easier for the two of them. Smirking, the guy asked if she wouldn't be happy if Persephone hovered around her lover and didn't go outside. The girl did not answer his monologue. I only thought that he was the culprit of everything that happened between the two goddesses. He continued to say that she didn't want to act unreasonably and get punished. Turning in her direction, the guy said that there is a punishment for disobedience to the foundations, which will not bypass even God. Rukalis looked at him indignantly, wondering if he really thought it was so easy to scare her. The jealousy of the gods is very fierce, but he himself coveted someone else's wife and now dared to ask her for such a thing. She heard that Hephaestus openly asked his younger brother if he was ashamed to show his love for his wife so openly. Ares and Aphrodite once had sex right above all of Olympus, while in the nets. The angry husband of the goddess of beauty screamed loudly for them to immediately go down to the ground before he broke the net. Therefore, now the daughter of Hades thought that, even being disgraced in front of all the gods, looking at Ares, who continues to run after her, Aphrodite's preferences seem quite broad, she then suggested that it was not only the appearance of the god of war, but also something else. Having heard no response from her, Eris assumed he could take that as a positive answer. Approaching her closely, he menacingly announced that this scoundrel must be killed. The young goddess was horrified, a shiver ran down her spine, and she thought that this god was completely mad. It seemed to her that because he was increasing the population of the underground kingdom, his very opinion had grown to the limit. The girl suggested that the goddess of beauty, Aphrodite, apparently really only saw his face. As she descended one of the many staircases of Olympus, she thought that in fact, she had not originally planned to resurrect Adonis. Rukalis firmly decided that she did not want to go to Tartarus because of him, even if he was handsome. However, she was greatly frightened by a conversation with the god of war Ares, who clearly made it clear what consequences awaited her. Now she didn't know what was best to do, because everything inside her was twisted. The young goddess suddenly remembered that Zeus himself also told her not to do this. Deciding to stop worrying about all the events, she went back to drink the nectar. There was one truth that this girl missed. The reason why, on the day of the banquet, Zeus gave instructions about resurrection. Many people were waiting for her, screaming and exclaiming that they loved her very much. One of them carried in his arms a little girl pierced by a sword, asking the goddess of resurrection to bring her back to life. Another girl pushed him away, saying that her body burned in a fire and became ashes, but she believed that it was possible to resurrect him. On Olympus, everyone knows about the danger of disrupting the course of life, but still, there are a lot of people who want to return someone close to life. At the same time, Hermes lay sweetly on the lap of one of the fairies and slowly ate a red apple. The fairy said that she had not seen the little goddess for a long time and reminded that Erebus had entrusted her to him. God knows, she threw the rest of the apple into her mouth, grabbed the fairy with a strong hand, and playfully asked if she was okay. Leaning on the table, Rukalis reasoned that if she had known that everyone would stick to her like that, she would never have come to Olympus. 
She didn't understand how the inhabitants could do such a thing, because this was not an auction, and everyone was trying to get her. Someone shouted for her to help him first. Others chanted in unison for him to keep his turn, but she herself did not want to resurrect anyone. Her thoughts were interrupted by Hermes approaching and asking her why she looked like that. He masterfully pretended that he did not understand what was wrong with her, so he decided to ask if she really enjoyed creativity, or if something was bothering her. Coming closer, God knows that, apparently, the rumors that she was being pursued everywhere by those who wanted to resurrect someone were indeed true. She said that for three days on the beautiful Olympus, they dumped corpses, brought bodies with flies flying around them, and even threatened her. After that, the girl squeezed the glass in her hand and said that she was not in the mood to talk. Hermes exhaustedly informed her that Hades had gone somewhere to be alone. The young goddess suggested that the reason for this could be giants or something else, and the guy calmly said that the problem was the titans. The girl turned to him, looked frighteningly into his eyes, and asked if he really knew something about this. Two predictions were brought down to Earth. The first was that the Titans would invade Olympus. The second prediction was that the son of Zeus would get rid of them all and liberate their beautiful abode. Hermes ended his story by saying that ten years had already passed since this prediction, after which he noticed that his ward was very drunk. The girl indignantly asked what kind of love this is, that everyone brings rotting bodies to her and asks her to resurrect them. She added that if they love and miss them so much, they should come to them in the afterlife or pray to Zeus. God knows, he covered his face with his hand, but when he moved it away, he saw the young goddess lapping something from the goblet. He asked the man standing next to his ward and holding a corpse in his arms what he was doing. Snatching the glass from his hands, the guy asked if he really thought that if she drank too much, who would agree to be resurrected? The girl angrily asked to return the drink back to her, but Hermes insisted that Erebus had ordered him to keep an eye on her. He added that she had already had enough drinking and suggested she go to bed, to which she indignantly asked him if he really thought she was drunk. Hearing an affirmative answer, Rukalis pointed a finger at herself and said that goddesses do not get drunk. Rising from her seat, she asked in surprise whether he had ever seen the goddess of resurrection drunk, to which he replied that he saw it right now. The daughter of Hades cheerfully twirled her hand from head to chest, announcing that she was a goddess, and he did not know how great her powers were. His silence irritated her even more, so she again asked him if he knew how great her power was. It seemed to her that God knew that she had decided that she was drunk, but she could not accept this fact. Approaching one of the rooms, she was still waving her arms, shouting that she would destroy Olympus, because everything here was unbearable. But Hermes only thought that when this little girl wakes up, she will be very ashamed. Lying on the floor with a glass of wine on her head, Rukalis wondered if he had ever been in love with a human woman. The guy asked in surprise if she was really interested in such a topic, to which he received an affirmative answer. He told her that she once existed, to which the goddess of resurrection asked where she had gone now. Hermes said that he had not told anyone before, but he would tell her as soon as she wiped the wine from her face. Why did the guy calmly tell him that his beloved had been dead for several hundred years? The girl asked if he needed her to resurrect her, to which God knows that she would not be able to resurrect the dust into which her bones had already been worn down. Rukalis realized that if he said that, then apparently the two of them had gone through a lot. She asked why he refused so easily if the taxi loved this man so much, since her father still wanted to have Persephone, despite the fact that she ran away from him. Looking at his eyes, the daughter of Ada asked with interest whether he really didn't love her anymore. Having hit the young goddess on the head, the guy declared that he loved her very much, to which she howled that it would be better instead of hitting him to tell her what she was like. Hermes, with complete indifference, told her that he did not know this at all, to which the girl thought that he was trying to deceive her. The guy laughed heartily and remembered that she probably had long hair, and she seemed to be very beautiful, to which Rukalis noticed that his face lit up. He calmly added that he remembered that the girl was very fond of various flowers. God knows, he treasured her like his own breath, so after her death, at first he really missed her. Then ten years passed, then one hundred years, and then several hundred more years, after which he stopped visiting her grave. Every time he visited her, the guy cried bitterly about his lost life and his immortal form. Now he spoke enthusiastically about the fact that he had completely forgotten her face, name, smile, and voice. At the end, Hermes sadly added that if she felt that she was falling in love with a person, then it was better for her not to even start. The girl listened to him calmly, remembering that smile when he tried to remember his beloved, but told him that not starting something out of fear is the lot of cowards. 
she asked what she should do if she still fell in love with a person. He explained to her that one of the options was to run away, that she had the strength to ultimately not see her lover die. The second option is to kill your loved one before you lose your head from love. Hermes explained to her that if she didn't choose either option, she would end up suffering. For a long time, gods who were in love with people could never find their happiness. For example, the moon goddess Selene fell in love with the handsome shepherd Endymion, and in order to save him from aging, she plunged him into eternity sleep. The goddess of the dawn, Eos, once fell madly in love with the Trojan prince, the hero Typhon. She asked the gods to grant her lover immortality so that she could always be with him. Hermes said that Selena could only forever whisper to the sleeping guy about her love while he slept. He then added that Eos, looking at the fearless but aging Typhon, turned him into a cicada and kept him close all his life. The girl said that she was completely different from Selena and Eos, so she would never do that. She said that she asked him to talk about love, and he told her about goddesses. The guy suggested that she would soon have a clear example in the form of Persephone and Adonis. God knows that in any case, there are already enough gods who suffer from love for man. He said that their moral strength is not replenished. They can only wait until the moment when they completely forget their loved ones. Seeing the gods around, crying over the bodies of the dead, Hermes languidly said that they could only wait until hundreds of years passed. Rukalis listened very carefully to his story, realizing the depth of emotions experienced. Before her eyes closed, she heard the god's instructions about what she should do if she did fall in love with a person. The next morning, Zeus woke up in his bed with one of the handmaidens after a wonderful night. Seeing her, he gently hugged the fairy and asked if she slept well, to which he heard in response that her master was always beautiful. God informed her that this was their last night, even though they were a perfect couple. Suddenly, someone stirred in the bed, so the man decided that he had brought two people with him. Lifting the blanket, he saw under it the frightened daughter of Hades, who also did not understand what she was doing there. She politely greeted the god, but then her gaze dropped lower, to the object located between her legs and covered with a leaf. Zeus frantically pulled her out from under the blanket and covered her naked body, not understanding how she even ended up in his bedroom. Rukalis embarrassedly said that since she was in the room of Zeus, who loves curvy beauties, then most likely he wanted to try something new. The highest god looked at her sternly and said that she was dressed, and there was a need to first pay attention to this and then make guesses. The girl happily sat up on the bed and assumed that she must have drunk a lot and somehow entered their room. Covering himself and his mistress, he told her not to get so drunk in the future. The young goddess made a sweet face, confirmed his words, and invited him to continue his morning exercises. Zeus thought for a while and then said that half of the celebration had already passed, after which he asked her if she was really up to something. Rukalis smiled sweetly, laughed quietly, and said that she had completely forgotten about it. The highest god informed her that since she had lived in the underground kingdom since birth, it would most likely be difficult for her to understand the structure of the world on the surface. He added that he would like her to stay longer on Olympus and told her to think about it before leaving. The young goddess embarrassedly asked if the ruler's taste had really changed, to which he quickly replied that he did not mean that. Looking at her hand as if she were wearing a watch, she announced that it was already quite late and she had to go. Quickly running to the door, she waved her hand to those lying in the bed and politely said goodbye to everyone. At the end, the girl added that he should have a good time with the fairy, to which he irritably thanked her. The goddess of resurrection hoped that this would all end and went to look for Hermes. Everyone around began to discuss the daughter of Hades and Zeus, but she did not understand at all what context they were talking about. God knows, he burst into laughter because the girl found herself in such an interesting situation. She calmly asked him if he really couldn't restrain himself and started a rumor about them. The guy, barely holding back his laughter, tried to apologize to her. Rukalis was not happy about this at all, but her angry speeches were interrupted by Hephaestus who came up from behind. On the surface, in addition to the god of news Hermes, Rukalis had one more friend. Seeing him, she rushed into his arms, fleetingly remembering that it was he who made the golden chairs, because he was the god of blacksmithing. Hugging his longtime girlfriend, the elder said that he had seen the initiation ceremony and asked if she was having a good time. Smiling, the girl said contentedly that she didn't know how to spend her time in any other way and asked him the same question. The elderly man reported that he had heard that she had made a fuss in their father's room, to which he received an affirmative answer. The young goddess said that someone started a rumor, alluding to Hermes. The guy, in turn, explained that she herself opened the door to the room and got in there. Then he added that it happened right in the middle of the action, 
so he could not intervene in any way. All three were awkwardly silent, not daring to utter a sound, each thinking about his own. Finally, the god of blacksmithing interrupted the pause, saying that he had recently made something, after which he invited them to look at his product. The completely embarrassed daughter Ada angrily asked what was going on, and God knows at that time put his hand on her shoulder and advised her to keep her head higher. Hephaestus showed his creation, golden girls who made the deepest impression on the young goddess. The elderly man added that he has been having trouble moving lately, so he made them to help him. He said that when he needs to puff up his furs, or when he needs to handle something hot, they help him a lot. Rukalis was already hugging one of them, indignant that her friend had not told her about it sooner, and asked him to give her one of them. Her eyes were full of desire to get the precious gold item, and a little saliva flowed from her mouth. From behind the bushes, the stranger watched the conversation of the three gods, and clearly heard the pleas of the young goddess. The old man, with sadness in his voice, said that he was very sorry, but he only had two golden girls, and he believed that he needed both of them. Hearing this, the girl immediately sank, lowered her head, and did not answer anything to her old friend. To his question about whether she really liked the golden girls so much, she turned and nodded her head affirmatively. Seeing her interest, the god of blacksmithing said that before making these two, he had one unsuccessful attempt. A glimmer of hope appeared on the face of the young goddess. So when he asked if she wanted him to bring her to her, the girl answered loudly and clearly in the affirmative. Hephaestus explained that although he called it unsuccessful, the problem is only related to character, otherwise there is nothing serious. Before he could finish speaking, his little friend immediately flew up to him with enthusiastic cries of gratitude. While in an embrace, the god of blacksmithing declared that she was the only one who embraced him. Hearing these words, God knows, stood in a pose that said that he too was ready to hug the elderly man. Seeing this, Hephaestus directly said that he would not hug Hermes, to which he yelled that God was cruel. The incident with the daughter of Hades in Zeus's bedroom brought an unexpected result. Zeus declared that from now on excessive requests were prohibited, particularly against the young goddess's excessive drinking. The boy bringing the bowls was very worried about such news. The Supreme God also declared that serious action must be taken for behavior that crosses the line. Then he looked at the God of News and furiously asked if he really understood the seriousness of his offense, to which the guy answered in the affirmative. After some time, Hermes and Rukalis walked through the garden, and the girl happily talked about how now no one would bother her anymore, after which she smugly announced that this Olympus of theirs stood in the crosshairs of her throat. Trying to protect her abode, God knows, she announced that she simply did not feel the full charm of this place, because she had not yet been to the local market. A crowd of girls suddenly appeared in front of them, excitedly discussing something. The girl assumed that, judging by the cheers, this was not some kind of fight. She abruptly rushed into the crowd, saying that perhaps there was something interesting on this boring Olympus. Among the dense crowd, she saw a god with purple hair and a cheeky look. Feeling a strange gaze on him, the guy turned towards the mysterious guest and greeted the young goddess. Dionysus stood in front of her, asking her to forgive him for being late for such an important event. The girl lowered her eyes in embarrassment and said that nothing bad had happened. The crowd shouted that they were waiting for him, to which God apologized to his guests and went to them. Hermes approached her and asked why she tensed so much at the sight of Dionysus, to which she told him to shut up. Dionysus has the power to create an atmosphere suitable for fun and entertainment. However, she clearly remembered her conversation with Thanatos about the worshippers of this god. Therefore, the girl modestly replied that she simply felt uncomfortable and asked to quickly leave the crowd. If the gods are not pleased, the bath can raise a city to the ground or destroy an entire country. Since the gods created people, they can also destroy them, like ordinary insects. The young goddess was tormented by many thoughts about the freedom of the gods, so she quickly left the noisy company. Suddenly, a guy approached her, Rukalis looked up at him and saw that Adonis himself was standing in front of her. To her question about why he came to her, the guy replied that she wanted to talk to her a little. Walking further into the garden, the girl thought that he had probably come to convey Aphrodite's words. They were followed everywhere by white swans, which were symbols of the goddess of love and beauty. It seemed to the young goddess that these birds were watching them, but even if not, she did not understand why the guy was taking her to such a remote place. Not wanting to go any further, Rukalis firmly asked what Aphrodite had asked her to convey. Adonis turned around and said that here his beloved would not be able to hear what he was going to tell her. He then added that the goddess wanted Rukalis to resurrect him as quickly as possible. The guy explained that his beloved wants him to be resurrected and stay with her forever. 
Lowering his voice a little, he said that he wanted the young goddess to refuse her this request. The girl couldn't believe what she just heard, so she asked again if he understood that this was certain death for him. Adonis very calmly and consciously answered her in the affirmative and said nothing more. The young goddess asked him in surprise if he really wanted to be stuck in the underworld for the rest of his life and never see Aphrodite again. He just shrugged his shoulders in a relaxed manner. But the goddess of resurrection did not let up and suggested that it was all to blame for Ares, who also intimidated him. Then she made a completely logical conclusion that most likely Adonis did not love the goddess of beauty. The guy became very embarrassed, answered her negatively, and asked who could not love her. Then she suggested that perhaps he loved her mother more than Aphrodite, to which he replied that of course he loved her too, but that was not the point. Walking in the shade of the trees, Adonis asked the young goddess if she liked his appearance. Rukalis gave a childish thumbs up and said he was quite handsome. Seeing the expression on his face, she immediately realized that this was not what he really wanted to hear. The guy told her that whether it was Aphrodite or Persephone, they would never change. He then added that this was the main reason that, unlike the Almighty, ordinary people grow old and die with the passage of time. The girl did not fully understand why he was leading, but deep down, she realized that he had been thinking about this question for a very long time. Adonis explained that the older he gets, his appearance, which everyone considers beautiful, will gradually change as he ages. Taking a break from his reflection in the water of the waterfall, he easily looked at the goddess of resurrection and said that he was not ready to feel this. In the temple on Olympus, many gods felt disgusting after the arrival of Dionysus because they were overtaken by the consequences of intoxicating drinks. Hermes, watching everything that was happening, thought that his ward had long gone somewhere and Aphrodite was somehow smiling mysteriously. Seeing Ares next to her, the guy involuntarily decided that these gods were up to something wrong. Adonis approached them, joyfully informing his beloved that he had returned. The goddess of love gently touched his cheek and asked if everything went well, to which he replied in the affirmative. Realizing that the young goddess had not returned with Adonis, Hermes immediately went in search of her. The guy was indignant and cursed out loud about where this little guy could have gone so quickly. Having met an unfamiliar guy on the road, he asked him if he had seen a girl with curly purple hair, to which he pointed in the direction where she had gone. After some time, Hermes, sweaty from running, finally found the young goddess in the depths of the forest. He thought that he shouldn't have let her go, but rather held on tighter, because this fool was making all the gods around her worry. When a serious struggle for power broke out on Olympus, Erebus seated the throne and descended with the Titans into the underworld, becoming the second god after Zeus. Hermes knew that he was very close to the daughter of Hades, and was also her mentor, who was very protective of her from an early age. God knows, he realized that if something happened to the girl, the Titans, who were harboring grudges between them, might rise again. He also remembered the expression on the face of Rakalish, whom he had last seen, which did not inspire anything good. Therefore, now he ran as fast as he could through the forest in search of the missing ward that Erebus had assigned him. He eventually found her sitting near the fountain all alone, the young goddess staring at him in surprise. Looking at her eyes, the guy flushed and furiously said that she had no idea how many beautiful fairies he had missed while he was waiting for her. Rukalis didn't like his words, so she asked him why he was like this and when he would finally grow up. Hermes smiled mysteriously and asked her why she had such a lean expression on her face. The daughter of Hades reported that Adonis asked her not to resurrect him, to which God knows in surprise that he really said that he loved Persephone more. She laughed sarcastically and said that she herself thought the same thing, to which he answered her that the guy was just a fool with a cute face. The girl remembered how she tried to control herself in order to answer the request not to resurrect Adonis. Ultimately, the goddess of resurrection agreed, which greatly puzzled the god of news. During her conversation with Adonis, he admitted that Ares did intimidate him, but he was much more afraid of something completely different. Looking at the little goddess with a doomed look, he calmly said that he was afraid of slowly aging. It scared him that he would see Ares next to Aphrodite, who remained as young and handsome. After which, the guy asked the daughter of Hades to allow him to remain among the dead. Suddenly, Rukalis thought that Adonis's expression was very familiar to her. She remembered the look on Hermes' face when he tried to remember his first lover. Now God knows with annoyance that Adonis may be handsome, but he thinks very poorly. He added that he really thought that the goddesses stayed with him for so long just because they fell in love with his appearance. The guy was sure that throughout their eternal life, they had met many handsome men. 
The daughter of Hades said that she understood Hermes's reasoning perfectly, and if she thought a little, she could estimate how deep their love was. She thought that this short and thin boy was going to trample the love of the goddess of beauty with his desires. The girl raised her head up and reasoned that if Adonis raised his eyes a little, he could understand everything. Hermes jokingly suggested that the guy thought very humanly and then added that everyone decided that Aphrodite had settled down. He then asked if she really didn't say anything to Adonis because he thought she was quite close to him. The young goddess again raised her thumb up like a child and joyfully said that she definitely liked him because he was very handsome. After which she added that some are so beautiful that even if they like them, they really annoy her. If Adonis dies, he will never see his beloved Aphrodite again. The daughter of Hades suggested that at such a moment, the guy finally realizes that the goddess would love him, even if he were very old. The choice will have already been made, and all that will remain for him is endless regret and wondering whether Persephone really continues to love him because he is young and handsome. Rukalis concluded that he would probably forever regret his decision and constantly doubt her mother's love. Then she laughed sincerely and said that this could be harmful to him. Hermes listened to her carefully and then said that there was a green caterpillar sitting on her hair. The girl began frantically trying to remove the insect from her hair to the wild laughter of God knows. Having finished with the caterpillar, the young goddess angrily asked why he was laughing and added that it was a very serious conversation. The guy asked her forgiveness several times and decided that the goddess of resurrection had acted very wisely. He added that these are Adonis' problems, and he himself cannot judge them correctly. Hermes then explained that he would never understand why people make such capricious decisions. Rook Hollis good-naturedly apologized for thinking that God knows only how to get girls into his bed. The guy told her that it was a little unpleasant for him to hear such a face, after which he remembered that they had the last day of the celebration left and asked whether she wanted to stay on Olympus or return to the underworld. The young goddess looked at him mysteriously and said that she had been very busy all these days. She added that she initially wanted to return with her father to the underworld. Ada's daughter said that the more she listened to Adonis, the more disturbing thoughts crept in. To his question about what thoughts were troubling her, the girl calmly answered whether her father really loved her. It seemed to her that she was just a substitute for her mother for him, and she was worried about the question of whether he only disliked her because she was so much like her. A little embarrassed, Rukala said that all sorts of similar thoughts constantly creep into her head. Hermes sighed heavily and said that she was worried about more serious things than he thought, to which she replied that dad was everything to her. The girl said that she still hardly sees him because he is always busy. After listening to her carefully, the guy concluded that there would always be only one answer, so he advised her to ask her father personally. The last day of the ceremony arrived, and before she could do anything, she was forced to make a decision about where she would stay. Unexpectedly, the god of the underworld returned to Olympus, greatly surprising everyone present. To his question about how she was feeling, Rukalis excitedly answered that everything was fine with her, but in the new depths of her soul, she was very embarrassed. Zeus interrupted their conversation, asking her if she had made her final decision. He then moved close to her ear and quietly asked her if he could count on her. His gaze pressed on her, and Hermes's gaze was full of hope, but the daughter of Hades was finally able to make a decision. The goddess of resurrection announced to all those gathered that she was returning with her father to the underworld. Olympus is not a bad place, where there are blooming flowers, shimmering light, and everything that cannot be seen in the underworld. But even so, Rukalis loved the underworld because she was born and raised there. Sitting in the carriage, she thought that she did not regret that she had visited Olympus, because Hermes and the good fairies were there. Everyone tearfully wished them a good trip, promising to visit them one day. The fairies handed her a beautiful bouquet of daisies, after which they fled in fear, because the god of war was rushing towards the little goddess. Ares squeezed the daughter of Hades tightly in his arms and joyfully said that he heard everything. He explained that she refused to resurrect Adonis, after which he stated that if she needed anything, Anna could safely turn to him. Pressing her even tighter to himself, the joyful lover of Aphrodite said that he was now her debtor. The goddess of beauty watched them all this time, indignant at this decision of the goddess of resurrection. Zeus also approached them, once again asking her if she was really returning to the underworld. Hades grabbed Ares by the hair to pull him away from his daughter and told Zeus that their conversation was over. The supreme god added that he simply wanted to say that she had one last opportunity, to which her father replied that they did not need her. She loved the glitter of gold and the endless supply of precious stones, but most of all, 
Rokalis loved her father's approval. Now, sitting in the carriage, she thought that dad always gives her what she asks, because he calmly gives her gold and silver, and even gave her the fields of asphodel. She then concluded that while it would be great to stay on Olympus, this would never happen. The underworld was her real place, where she could live happily forever. She had a dream in which a stranger stood in a cloak, asking her if she really loved gold and jewelry. He said that she liked that it was Hades who gave them to her, and then asked if she was sure that these things were for her. The man said that she was just a pitiful little goddess who was worth nothing. He asked that if her mother loved her father, would the god of the underworld still love her? Suddenly, the stranger, with a deft movement, threw off his cloak, and Persephone was underneath it. The woman asked her what would happen if it turned out to be false love. Then her mother grabbed her by the throat and continued to talk about how there was something she could never have by wishing alone. Shedding tears, she explained that she had taken it from the young goddess quite a long time ago. Waking up from sleep, the girl was very alarmed. Beads of sweat were running down her face, and her mind could not believe what she had dreamed. Bending over, Rukalis tried to bring herself to her senses and realized that it was just a strange dream. The father noticed that something was wrong with his daughter, so he asked what happened to her. The girl breathed deeply, after which she regained her senses and replied that she was fine. The god of the underworld showed her his love materially, so even if he didn't put his soul into it, she didn't care. She was ready to be content with just his smile, remembering the past events of his life. It was for this reason that the daughter of Ada did not want to disturb her beloved father again. She thought about how there were always so many gods who loved her next to her that it seemed to her that she did not need her father's love. Her thoughts were interrupted by the quiet voice of her father, affectionately calling his daughter by name. Having gained her attention, he said that if she wanted to ask something, she should definitely ask. Hades calmly added that he would try to answer her with all his honesty. The girl doubted for a very long time whether she should ask a secret question, but gathered her courage and asked her father if he really loved her. The god of the underworld was greatly taken aback by this question and looked at her silently for a while. Realizing that the pause had lasted long enough, he finally asked her, puzzled, why she decided to ask such a question. Hades tried his best to ensure that his only daughter always had what she wanted. He made every effort to, contrary to his character, say kind words to her. Taking a deep breath, her father replied that he loved her very much and was even ready to give her the throne. He didn't know that that wasn't the main problem at all, and Rook Hollis gently stated that this was not proof that he loved her. The girl proudly said that giving up the throne is something that can be done without love. Rukalis reminded him that even when she was in Zeus's bedroom, her father had not said anything to her. Hades always believed that love is something you can hold in your hands. Therefore, now his daughter shed bitter tears, asking him if he really loved her. Then the girl quietly asked if he really saw her as a replacement for Persephone. Everything that he considered an expression of his love became only a reason for doubt. He recalled that day when his lover hated him, saying that the one who suffered from his love was none other than her. Father Rukalis had no idea that if you pick a flower, you will definitely doom it to death. The god of the underworld remembered the day when he first saw his beloved. He believed that everything happened in a second when he saw the goddess of spring laughing among the flowers. Hades had never experienced such a strong feeling and was as if enchanted by her beauty. He took her with him to the underworld and chained her, and Persephone kept telling him not to deceive himself, because this is not love at all. The girl tried to convey to him that he was just trying to chain her to him. Persephone was his favorite flower, which he unknowingly picked, and now he listened to her pleas for him to release her to the surface. In a fit of rage, the god of the underworld fed her a small piece of sour fruit. He thought that she was his from the very beginning, so he gave her a pomegranate seed from the underworld, because if you eat something from this world, you will be stuck in it forever. Persephone could not believe that the god of the underworld would resort to such a trick. She tried every method to get the object out of her, but nothing worked. Hades felt neither regret nor remorse, because one does not apologize to property, but by the time he regretted it, it was too late. Fairies in Olympus whispered that the young goddess of resurrection spent the night in the bedroom of Zeus himself. The god of the underworld unwittingly overheard their conversation, and at that moment realized that this was his punishment. He returned to his room and reasoned that if he had not done this to the goddess of spring, if he had not acted like an asshole, then everything would have been different. Father Rukalis could not contradict Zeus, who helped him with the kidnapping of the goddess of spring. His only concern was that he had led his child, for whom he wished the best, into a trap. Now, sitting in the cart, Hades told his daughter that he had never thought of her as a replacement, because he loved her. 
The father added that he had never loved anyone as much as he loved his daughter and said that he wanted her to always be with him. Without thinking for a long time, he declared that even if she were not the daughter of Persephone, he would still love her. The god of the underworld added to his words that even if she did not look like her mother, he would still love her. The girl listened carefully to her father's story and watched the reaction on his face. Hades said that he never thought that anything would change if he told her this, but he always loved her. Turning towards his daughter, he saw that she bowed her head and did not answer him in response. After a short pause, Rukalis understood her face and said that this changes a lot. Smiling and trying to hide her tears, she said that if she had not heard this, she would have been unhappy forever. The young goddess of resurrection joyfully thanked her father for the words he had spoken. After a frank conversation, the daughter of Ada mockingly clarified whether they were going in the right direction, to which her father answered her in the affirmative. The image of Persephone still wandered in the thoughts of the little princess of the underworld. This image was asking her if she really thought her father's love was the right love. The fairies in the underworld were talking about how there was a possibility that Rukalis could remain on Olympus. One of them was worried that they would never hear her stupid laugh again. Oises unwittingly witnessed this conversation and could not believe what she heard. Many rumors spread about the young goddess, so now the goddess of pain believed that she should have shut up Hermes for constantly singing songs about Olympus. Oneros trembled and asked the other gods what they would do if their girl did not return. Oises nervously asked him, which of them is the god of worries, she or he, to which the god of dreams replied that he could not do anything with himself, as he was very worried. The god of death. Thanatos entered the conversation, saying that nothing could be done in this situation. He calmly said that if she didn't come, that would be the end of it, and then asked if they really wanted to kidnap her. His face was filled with fear and indignation, which took notice of all the gods present. Mom suggested that the underworld was not the best place for a young goddess to grow up, and Thanatos lamented that he should have gone with them. The god of ridicule listed reasons such as the eternally depressed fairies of Styx. Instead of dolls, there are only skeletons, and the only entertainment is sword fights. Oises and Eris sadly reasoned that everything turned out to be much worse than they all thought. Erebus stopped sitting silently, and assured them that only Rukalis herself could decide where it was good and where it was bad. He reassured everyone that the god of the underworld had not yet returned to them, and first of all, they should wait for him. Eris laughed and happily said that she and Thanatos were two boots in a pair, pretending that everything was fine. After a moment, she announced that the carriage had arrived, causing the gods to shake even more with excitement. The joyful young goddess of resurrection ran into their room, shouting that she had finally returned home. Oasis was the first to run up to her, asking the girl why she was so late. Suddenly, the girl stopped hugging her pupil, moved back a little, and began to carefully examine her. Up close, she noticed swollen eyes, a strong odor of alcohol and a rumpled dress. The goddess of pain screamed, asking why their charge had returned as a drunk. She bombarded the girl with questions about why her clothes were shabby, how much she drank, to which Rukalis noticed that the gods did not miss her at all. Erebus told her that they were all afraid that she would not return, so some went crazy. Oises screamed that the young goddess was the face of their kingdom, and Hades always appeared everywhere well-groomed, after which she asked why she looked completely different. The rest of the gods began to ask her whether she liked Olympus, whether it was very different from the underworld, to which she replied that that world was so full of luxury that she really wanted to release a couple of hundred swans on the river Styx. Then the girl imagined how terrified Charon would be from such an influx of birds. Oise sternly noted that before their arrival, something else had arrived in the underworld. The young goddess assumed that Hephaestus had finally sent her a gift in the form of a golden maiden. The god of dreams, Hypnos, asked if she was really happier with this thing than with her old acquaintances. He always loved to joke, so now he insisted that some golden maiden was more important to her than all the gods. The guy continued to talk about how they raised her, to which she replied that he definitely never raised her, and in general she grew up herself. While they were bickering among themselves, Thanatos's chief assistant invited him to come with him. The guy described in a few words the situation that happened on Olympus over these few days. The god of death put an innocent smile on his face and informed everyone that the young goddess had done something on Olympus. Confused, she found no other way out but to report that she had simply overdone a little nectar. Then the enraged Thanatos furiously asked her if her feet themselves had brought her to Zeus's room. The girl frantically grabbed Hypnos, asking him not to leave her, and tried to calmly answer that she did not think that they would find out about this incident. 
the god of death approached her as close as possible, breathing heavily and about to seriously punish her. Thanatos glared at her and furiously asked what her last words would be. The girl answered in fear that she was ready to endure the spanking, to which he replied that she should try to endure this pain. This is how her initiation ended. Not even three months had passed before Rukalis regretted her return to the underworld. The maids looked for her throughout the castle, because immediately after initiation, the gods are obliged to begin their duties. But the daughter of Hades tried with all her might to avoid this. It seemed to her that the main problem was that there were too many of these responsibilities. The maids walked further down the corridor, and the young goddess sat down on the floor and exhaled calmly, hoping that the trouble had passed her by. As she watched them leave, she reasoned that she was doing too much and that she had been given too much work in such a short period of time. Suddenly, her thoughts were interrupted by a blow that missed her by only a couple of centimeters and hit the wall. In front of her stood the golden girl that Hephaestus had given her, telling her that she needed to go back and finish her work. In addition to the problem of fulfilling a large number of duties, the goddess of resurrection faced a much larger problem in the form of the golden maiden Velita. The maids heard the sound of the blow and hastened to find out what caused such a roar. Hephaestus's golden item couldn't control its power and couldn't adapt to the situation at all. The girl suggested that Velita run away quickly, but the hand of the golden statue got stuck in the wall, so the maids immediately found them. Made of gold, it was very beautiful, but unfortunately for its owner, she never left it alone. One day, Rukalis was hiding in the closet from her, hoping that she would not find her, because the palace was so big and it was impossible to turn it upside down. To the deepest regret of the daughter of Hades, Velita quickly discovered her mistress. Opening the closet, the golden dresser said that while she was looking for her, her mistress was already late. Opening the closet door all the way, Hephaestus told her that she needed to go to work. She found the goddess of resurrection in absolutely any place, even in such private places as the toilet. The young goddess tried to hide on the roof of a castle in the underworld, but the golden maiden found her there too. Even when the girl was simply trying to relax in her bedroom, Velita was under the bed and was a constant reminder that her mistress had unfinished business. Rukalis looked doomedly at the ceiling and said that she would not be able to do these things until her death. The golden statue answered her that her mistress was immortal, so she simply could not die. Velita was completely unaware of the meaning of the word compromise, so now the maids observed the huge hole she left in the wall. One of them politely asked if her creator knew that she was destroying the palace that he had built, and the other maid decided to take the young goddess to perform her duties. When leaving, the girl told the golden maiden that there was nothing but beauty in her. Gift Hephaestus gave her a thumbs up, thinking it was a compliment. The maid held the enraged young goddess as she tried to run up to prove to Velita that it was not a compliment. The girl shouted that as soon as possible, she would run away from the underworld. The messenger was running towards them as fast as he could, so when Rukalis saw him, she immediately asked what had happened. The guy tried to catch his breath, sweat appeared on his face, gathering his strength, he said that Thanatos had brought Adonis. There was only one case in which a living person came to the underworld at the invitation of the god of death. The messenger wearily but loudly announced the sudden death of the guy for whom two goddesses fought. Not long ago, the subject of the dispute asked her not to resurrect him under any circumstances, so the young goddess knew that sooner or later this had to happen. However, upon hearing the unexpected news, she realized that everything happened much earlier than she expected. People behaved as if they would live forever, but in fact, their life was very short. This is what the young goddess was thinking about while the maid was dragging her by the collar. The girl understood that at this very moment, she could not imagine what would happen in the underground world. In the underground court, where the further fate of the dead people was determined, the judge announced to everyone that they were all guilty. One of them tried to explain that there was a mistake, and he was not at all guilty. The judge's three heads simultaneously looked at the speaker and asked if he really had any objections. Because of such an evil look, the man was unable to say a word, to which the judge continued to tell him to get out of the room because he had a lot to do. Rukalis sat just above the judge and watched the entire process, after which she wondered out loud if they couldn't just find everyone guilty at the same time. The judge's three pairs of eyes turned furiously towards the young goddess who had spoken, making her feel uneasy. The daughter of Hades apologized and thought that they had perked up their ears as always. The girl continued to watch the court process. She wanted to wait for the decision regarding Adonis. Remembering the last day she spent with Adonis, Rukalis wondered if he regretted asking not to be resurrected. Thanatos, who approached her, 
calmly said that the subject of her expectations was the first to volunteer for the underground court. Seeing her surprised expression, the god of death said that while she was avoiding her duties, he finished everything before the trial. The girl smiled sweetly and said that this was the reason why he came to her. The guy ignored this and only strictly punished her not to be lazy either, after which he told her that there was something unexpected, because when this guy came, he thought that the deceased would be very noisy, but he was surprisingly very quiet. The goddess of resurrection grabbed the god of death by the sleeve and loudly exclaimed that he was as busy as always. She then added that as soon as one dies, he immediately takes up his work. A golden maiden appeared at the door of the court, too obviously looking for her mistress. Valida did not stand on ceremony and began to loudly notify the entire hall about why she had come to them. Hephaestus's gift announced that Lady Demeter had invited Lady Rukalis to Elysian. Demeter is the patroness of the harvest, the goddess of the earth, and most importantly, the mother of Persephone. Among all the gods of Olympus, she valued blood ties most of all, and especially her daughter. Therefore, when her daughter disappeared from the human world, the earth goddess was in great sadness. She wandered and could not find a place for herself, trying to understand what happened to Persephone. The earth goddess withdrew from arable work, so the earth became empty, after which a long winter began in the earthly world. People were starving because they could not grow their own food, and animals were dying of hunger. Many hoped for the speedy arrival of spring, and this thought gave them hope, but in the end, people died. Then Zeus descended into the earthly world and saw that at this rate, all people would die of hunger. Zeus, who hid the fact that Hades stole Persephone, eventually revealed the secret to Demeter. It was too late, because by that time, her daughter had already eaten the fruit from the underworld. Demeter realized that for the underworld, this was just another form of entertainment. She hugged her daughter, cried, and said that if she had understood everything earlier, she would have been able to come to the rescue in time. The mother was too weak to punish them, so she sometimes went down to the underworld to see her daughter and granddaughter. The earth goddess was always very kind to Persephone, talking about how beautiful she was becoming every day. One day she would say that Rukalis looked like her mother, and the next she would slap her in the face. In moments of anger, Demeter told the young goddess that Tanya was the only one who dared to stare at her and called her an unwanted child. Heading to Elysian, the goddess of resurrection told Thanatos that she was very uncomfortable. She added that her grandmother is sometimes kind and sometimes evil with her, so she doesn't know which side of her to face this time. The guy answered her that she could simply not go to Elysian because she was not obliged to agree to the invitation. Daughter Ada stretched tiredly and said that since she was invited, why not come? Hearing her answer, the god of death stated that the girl just wanted to get to Elysian, to which she answered in the affirmative. Seeing his thoughtful face, she explained that Elysian was a place created specifically for the souls of heroes, and therefore was the only paradise in the entire underground kingdom. After which Rukalis added that if the opportunity to go there arose, she would definitely take it. The god of death looked carefully at the very happy face of his little companion and did not find the words to answer her. Ultimately, he said that she was free to do whatever Togo herself wanted, to which she replied that even if she was hit in the face, she would be glad that she visited Elysian. The guy tried to stop her, saying that if such a punishment awaited her, then she should not go there. But the girl did not listen to him at all and headed towards the Golden Gates. Watching the gates close behind her, he waved his hand tiredly and advised her to be careful. The gate slammed shut, after which he thought about how nice it would be if she didn't quarrel with anyone. A moment later, a loud sound of surprise was heard throughout Elysian, which caused Thanatos to be seriously frightened. There was only one reason for Rukalis's cry. Elysian, where Persephone lived, was so beautiful that she could not hold back her scream. She reasoned out loud that the shine of gold in this place was even more beautiful than on Olympus itself. The girl could not believe that her mother saw this beauty every day and thought that this was truly a worthy place to ask Hades for it. Then she picked a golden pear and admired it for some time, but the fairy accompanying her reminded her that Persephone and Demeter were waiting for her. This did not stop the young goddess, so she collected all kinds of fruits on the way to her mother. Walking into the greenhouse, the first thing Rukalis did was happily greet her mother. A beautiful scarlet flower was inserted into the hair of the daughter of Hades. Her mood was magnificent. Her fun was interrupted by Persephone's rude voice, notifying her that she was very late. Watching Demeter drink tea, the girl thought how lucky she was that Adonis was not among them. Three goddesses and one person would create not very good rumors in the underworld. After a short silence, the guest politely greeted her grandmother Demeter. In response to this, the earth goddess asked her to tell her granddaughter what she had been doing lately, 
Rukalis good-naturedly replied that she was constantly busy with work, to which Persephone reported that she did not feel like she had much work to do. The girl sarcastically replied that so many urgent matters appeared because the place at the top was empty. Trying to hide her indignation, her mother asked if she had any hobbies, and then suggested that she was not interested in tea drinking or Ikebana. The goddess of resurrection happily talked about how, when she has time, she likes to ride on Cerberus or play with skeletons. The woman noticed that these were not the best hobbies for the young goddess, to which Rukalis replied that they were not the worst. Persephone quickly got tired of small talk, so she suggested moving from words to action. Sipping her tea, she asked if her daughter could guess what she wanted to ask her. Knocking back a mug of tea, the young goddess mockingly replied that she did not have the gift of reading minds. After that, she looked mysteriously at her mother and said that she herself could tell her what she wanted. Giving in to those whom she has always despised is not so easy, especially if you are a goddess who has only been revered all your life. Gathering her courage, Persephone reported that her beloved Adonis had ended up in the underworld. After a short pause, she continued and asked her daughter not to resurrect the object of her love. The daughter of Hades was a little disappointed that she confessed so honestly, because it came from this that Persephone valued Adonis very much. The girl decided to clarify whether this was an order, to which the goddess of spring replied that this was just a small request. Upon hearing her response, Rukalis said that she had the power to refuse her request, but her mother said that she had better listen when she asks. The earth goddess intervened in the conversation, trying to shout down her only granddaughter. The young goddess got on everyone's nerves, saying that they were really going to order her around with their useless royal name, after which she added so that they would not be mistaken, because, although she is small, her status in the underground kingdom is not lower than that of her mother. The angry Demeter rose from her chair, but the daughter of Hades explained to her that this was a matter of the underworld. The goddess of the earth became more and more indignant with each passing second, which was evident from her facial expression. The girl added that this is not in the jurisdiction of Zeus, so she cannot interfere in the affairs of a world that is not hers. Persephone interrupted her speech, saying that, if you believe her words, then according to the laws of the underworld, there is one more circumstance. The woman said that her pathetic authority should be much higher than that of her daughter. Looking angrily at the young goddess of resurrection, the mother said threateningly that she was the queen of the underworld. Persephone looked rather pathetic, so Rukalis always considered her mother oppressed and lost her support. Her mother often talked about how much she missed her daughter and the god of the underworld. However, when she saw the young goddess, she always became extremely angry, and the girl could not change any of this. Persephone often reminded Rukalis that she told her to stay out of sight, because the older she got, the more like her father she became. The woman always regretted that she did not kill her child on her birthday. As much as the mother hated her daughter, so much did her father love Rukalis. Only he always called his daughter by name and never wanted to wipe her off the face of the earth. Therefore, the girl always clung to the grains of her father's love, which she so rarely received. She knew that if she did not preserve this love, then there would be no meaning in her birth. Now, sitting at the table with Persephone and Demeter, the young goddess said that her mother gave up her crown because she did not want it. She then added that she had renounced her throne and responsibilities, and was now pointing at her with her special powers, after which she clarified whether she really considered herself a queen. The girl reasoned that her mother had only a shell of this status left. She said that the fact that Persephone was able to share Adonis with the goddess of beauty Aphrodite was all thanks to Hades. Pity and mercy could be an excellent shield to protect the goddess of spring. The daughter Hades calmly said that if she renounced her royal duties and throne, then she must also renounce royal power and authority. One day, the fairies of the underworld said that they had not seen Persephone for a long time. Then the girl made a sweet face and asked the burdensome question about whether they really didn't have enough of her. The girl explained to the young goddess that the point was that the world reputation of the underworld depended on its king and queen. Later she noticed that of course Persephone didn't care at all. The goddess of resurrection thought that her mother neglected everything except what she herself wanted. Rukalis informed her that if she wanted retribution, she should present the edge of a knife to her father's throat, because others had no reason to bear her anger or sadness. The girl remembered how long ago she had watched the god of the underworld working in his office. It was incomprehensible and unpleasant to her that her own mother could not deal with her feelings. Persephone glared at her daughter and couldn't believe that she was trying to teach her. The young goddess smiled sweetly and said that it was just good advice. Her mother jumped up from her seat, 
leaned her hands on the table, and angrily said that she had a lot of impudence. Demeter again intervened in the conversation, saying that this conversation should be ended. The earth throughout Elysian suddenly shook, and the earth goddess was angry and caused an earthquake. Rukalis looked at all this and thought that her grandmother was angry right up to the sparks from her eyes. The goddess of spring tried to stop her mother, saying that there was still something to be said. Demeter calmly noted that the servant saw everything, and if she continued talking about her royal status, she would continue to raise her voice. The daughter of Hades clapped her hands and announced that they had talked, and now she could return to her business with peace of mind. Trying to leave the greenhouse, she was stopped by the voice of her own mother, begging her to wait. The distraught woman asked if the young goddess was really going to resurrect Adonis. The girl answered truthfully that Aphrodite really asked her about it. She then added that she was very lazy, so she would not resurrect the subject of their dispute. Having calmed her mother with these words, Rukalis said that the grandmother should decide all other matters herself. After that, the young goddess of resurrection went back to the underworld. Before leaving, she stopped at the door and decided to finally tell Persephone what she was thinking. The girl spoke about her father, who tied her to himself, hiding behind his love, after which she stated that the goddess of spring did the same, locking Adonis in Elysian because of her love. Turning towards them, Rukalis smiled sweetly and said that in the eyes of people they look the same. The young goddess angrily said that unlike her, who only avoids everything, Adonis simply gave up and accepted it. Persephone's body was filled with terrible resentment towards her daughter. The woman walked forward, put her hand to her chest, and loudly declared that she was not like that at all. Demera tried to stop her daughter as she screamed that she and Adonis loved each other. Elysian is the only paradise in the underworld. Although it is an enviable place, it was good only for those who were trying to escape from reality. Persephone could not hold back her tears for a long time, because somewhere in the depths of her soul, she well understood that this was the cruel truth. After everything that happened, the girl went fishing in the river Styx, where Hermes found her. To his question about whether he and Persephone really had a fight, the young goddess replied that if he had not started rumors, she would have answered him. God knows, he continued to smile joyfully at her, waiting for an answer to his question. Then he added that he had heard that Demeter turned the earth upside down. Rukalis responded restrainedly that of course they had quarreled, but they had not fought, and the earth goddess had caused a small earthquake. The guy said that he was actually worried, to which the girl caught a fish with a skull on its head, and in response asked if he was worried about her mother. A drop of sweat ran down Hermes' face, and he tried to discreetly ask why she decided that way. The young goddess calmly remarked that she didn't care, and then asked if he really wasn't worried about her. God knows that he liked Persephone when he was very little, to which the girl asked him to say this over the river Styx. He decided to move the topic away from himself and clarified that Hades did not react in any way to what happened. While removing the skull from the fish, she confirmed his guess, suggesting that her father was so busy that he had not heard about it. Hermes noted that if he knew about it, then most likely Hades knew about it, and then asked if she would just remain silent about it. The girl laughed loudly and said that the god of the underworld was not such a person at all. Suddenly, the young goddess began to think that her business with Persephone was not yet finished. After thinking for a while, she asked loudly what she should do if her father hated her. Hermes tried to calm her down by saying that they had to resolve this issue after the ceremony, to which she replied that Hades said he loved her. To his question about why she was afraid then, the young goddess said that perhaps he would stop loving her when he found out what she had done in Elysian. Rukalis continued to sit sullenly on the riverbank, and God knows, looked at her questioningly. Breaking the silence, he asked whether love should really pass away from such a thing, and why she worries so much about it every day. Afterwards, he suggested that she go to her father and ask again, to which she replied that a lot of time had passed since her father loved her mother. The girl said that she did not know how infantile the question of which side he would take would sound. After some time, she was already standing near the door of the office of the god of the underworld. Gathering her will into a fist, the young goddess decided that she should still ask once. Hades's office was located in the most remote place of the main palace of the underworld. The young goddess walked past the bookshelves and reasoned that it was time for her to ask. Then her gaze fell on a beautiful gold bracelet with sapphires, which she saw for the first time. It was an indescribably beautiful place that seemed to Rukalis like a cave of treasures. Walking past them, she collected everything that caught her eye, rejoicing that it all looked much better on her hand. Approaching her father's table, the girl saw a small plant standing on it under a dome. Having examined him closely, she thought about whether her father really liked growing flowers. Approaching even closer, 
the young goddess reasoned that, judging by the artificially created light, Hades was protecting this plant. Her father approached the office, wondering why the guard was completely beaten and lying on the floor. Going inside, he found his daughter there, who pretended that she had not touched or done anything during his absence. To his question about why she did this to the guard, the girl replied that she did not notice at all how he fell. Rukalis held a small piece of that plant in her hand, listening to her father's speech about how next time she shouldn't cut it, but just warn her in advance about her arrival. The god of the underworld came closer to his daughter, knelt down and asked why she came to his office. Suddenly she remembered with what question she was heading to the office of the god of the underworld. The young goddess thought about asking him if he was angry that she talked to her mother in Elysian. She understood that she couldn't say for sure, so she put on a sweet face and said that she just missed her father so much. The girl froze because the same gold bracelet with sapphires fell out of her hand. Hades looked at the object with alarm and said in confusion that if she wanted to take it, she could take it with her. The goddess of resurrection was both happy and nervous, thanking her father for such generosity. The god of the underworld calmly asked her if she wanted anything else, to which Rukala said that she wanted a lot of things. He allowed her to walk around the office and take what she liked, but the girl's hand quickly stopped him, and the daughter herself said that she had not come for that at all. She quickly pulled herself together and loudly announced that she wanted to ask something completely different. Covering his birth with her small hand, the girl tried to suppress her growing excitement. The young goddess blurted out the question of who he loved more, her or Persephone. The girl did not immediately realize that she was still keeping her hand on her father's face, but after that, she instantly pulled it back. A puzzled Hades said that he loved them equally, to which Rukala said that she did not mean that. She worriedly asked who he would save first if they were both in trouble. The god of the underworld did not know what to answer for a long time, after which he tried to find the right words. He looked her straight in the eyes and asked with interest if she was really affected by what happened in Elysian. Her father told her that he already knew about what happened there because there was an earthquake and everything was reported to him. Hades asked if Persephone really asked not to resurrect her lover. Hearing an affirmative answer, he stood up abruptly and headed to his work chair. Sitting down at the table, the god of the underworld took a deep breath, closed his eyes, and tried to calm down. The girl felt that she had made a huge mistake and considered herself stupid because of it. She thought that her father loved her mother very much, so she believed that he could exile her to Tartarus forever. Instead of scolding, her father came up to her, put his hand on her head, and said that if she was being treated badly because of him, then she should not endure it. Hades said that they were taking out their anger on his little young goddess. He then calmly added that his daughter did not deserve all this anger and malice. The inspired girl asked whether, if her mother started such a quarrel again, he would smash her to smithereens. The god of the underworld calmly noted that this was too strong a word, but in general she was right. The young goddess jumped for joy, saying that she should have asked this much earlier, and Hades sighed in relief. He added that, to answer the question asked, he would have saved Persephone first. The father said this with an extremely calm face, as if thinking that such an answer would suit her. Deep down, she was indignant, but she smiled sweetly at him and said that she understood that he loved his mother more. Leaning back in his chair, the god of the underworld told her that he didn't think so at all. He said that of course he loved Persephone, but that was not the reason why he would save her first. Hades explained that he simply felt guilty towards her for everything he put her through. The father added that if this caused him to be late in rescuing his daughter and she drowned, then he would choose to die with her. The girl stood completely immobilized by the shocking words of her father. Hades said that if Persephone dies, then he will simply accept it and continue to live. But if she dies, then he will not be able to live further. Rukalis wiped tears from her face, which greatly frightened her father, who asked her if she was unhappy with his answer. The young goddess removed her hand from her face, smiled radiantly, and said that she was very pleased with the answer. The guard who was beaten by the daughter of Hades was also very pleased with the outcome of their dialogue. The girl, the goddess of resurrection Rukalis, the daughter of Hades and Persephone, was the tyrant of the underworld. Seeing her familiar ferryman in the distance, she shouted in a friendly manner to him to swim up to her. The young goddess asked him what he thought about someone being willing to die for her. Sitting among the dead, she reasoned that this was nothing more than a direct declaration of love. The daughter of Hades sighed, and said that her father considered his daughter the only one, and that he was ready to die for her. Climbing onto the neck of one of the dead, she concluded that it all looked like a wonderful dream. Rukalis was delighted that she finally understood what love everyone talks about is. Charon reported that even the one who did not believe in love suddenly started talking about it. 
The girl imagined that her father would take care of her so much that he would completely forget about his reputation. The carrier reminded her of Hermes, with whom approximately the same situation happened. After a short silence, he added that she had said nothing at all about the trip to Elysian. Holding tightly to the hair of the unfortunate deceased, the young goddess coldly said that she should not have gone there, and nothing happened there. At her words, Charon turned around and asked with interest whether she had caused problems there. Rukalis climbed off the dead man's neck, inflicting another portion of pain on him, and repeating that maybe she had argued a little, or maybe not. To her question about what he was getting at, the carrier replied that everything needs moderation. Many sparks ran between them, and the corpses sitting in the boat were afraid to die again. Deciding to change the subject, the girl said that she had brought something cool and took out a twig from her pocket, taken from her father's office. Getting on the boat, she said that she found it in the office of the god of the underworld, but had no idea what it was. Charon glanced at the plant and decided that most likely it was from the underworld. Rukalis asked him, puzzled, why she had not seen such a plant before. The carrier replied that of course the girl could not see him, because Persephone had placed a ban on him. Realizing all the information she had heard, she sharply asked if she understood correctly that it was all her mother's fault. Charon answered her question in the affirmative and explained that it was quite a long story. The king of the underworld with an icy heart stole the daughter of the fertility goddess and hid it in his home. Because of him, a fierce winter began on the surface, where people blamed Hades for everything. People considered him the culprit of all their problems, and many gods said that even if Olympus had collapsed, he still would not have been able to win her love. Everyone knew that the heart of the goddess of spring had turned to stone quite a long time ago. The goddess always considered him a source of misfortune, but he could not make her happy and only remained silent. Persephone bitterly regretted that she had ever met the god of the underworld. Realizing that most likely she would not be so sad, the woman could not stop crying. One day, his stone heart began to crumble little by little when a fairy confessed her love to him. She told him that she did not ask for reciprocity from him, but simply wished him happiness. The fairy said that with all her heart, she wished that he would not know troubles and would not taste sorrows. Light brown hair, sparkling green eyes, she reminded him of someone he loved. Of course, the fairy reminded him of Persephone, who, before all these events, sometimes even took care of him. Having made a wreath for him, the goddess of spring argued with the fairy about whether it was too thin. Watching his beloved, Hades saw in her a flower that was the most beautiful of all. Therefore, having met the fairy, the god of the underworld, he realized with horror that she was like two peas in a pod like Persephone, but fell in love with him even before the goddess of spring destroyed him. The fairy often watched him and was always friendly to him, rejoicing at every moment when she could see him. Having learned about this, Persephone told Hades that many people were saying that he had a special relationship with one fairy. Then she explained why he says he loves her, but he thinks about other women. Making a smile that didn't have a drop of mercy in it, the woman asked if her broken life wasn't enough for him. The god of the underworld knelt before her, saying that he was ready to do a lot. His only request was that Persephone leave the unfortunate fairy alone. The woman hoped that he would say this, after which she slapped him in the face and said that he could not hear her at all. She reminded him of how she had once asked him in the same way, on his knees, to let her go, but he pretended to be deaf. The goddess of spring could not forgive him for mocking and intimidating her, and now he himself was going to live happily. Persephone couldn't let Hades be happy, so she said that since she couldn't kill him, she could kill her. He grabbed him by the clothes, she continued to cry and talk about how he didn't let her be happy. A lot of time has passed since Hades heard about the death of his beloved fairy. Rukalis said that she would like to see her mother's face with which she said all these words. Charon said that now this was not at all important, but the daughter of Ada believed that it was just that important, and she was interested in the question of what relation this fairy had to the plant from her father's office. Putting the sprout between her lips, the young goddess heard that the name of this plant was Mint, and then Charon said that it grew on the grave of a murdered fairy. Then Persephone's anger inflamed even more. He added that Hades collected the body of his beloved fairy piece by piece and turned it into a plant. The carrier stated that Persephone did not like this, and she wanted to get rid of this plant in the underworld. Holding a mint sprout in her hands, the girl thought that her father himself had grown it and secretly cared for it in his office. After thinking a little, Rukalis said that in the first place on her father's list was her mother, in second place was the fairy, and in third was she. Charon told her that she draws conclusions very easily, but Hades did not like that fairy. To her question about why he then called her his mistress, 
The carrier replied that people become special to someone not only because of love. The girl wrapped her arms around her knees and said that there was something between them, so her mother did what she did. The man explained to her that focusing on the little things is how she is like her father. The young goddess smiled sweetly and sternly asked if he was really mocking her now. Having received an affirmative answer, she attacked the carrier with a loud squeal. Biting him on the shoulder, Rukalis heard him say that she should not take Hades' words about love as a frivolous joke. Hanging on his neck, she said that she knew about it and just wanted to earn it. Meanwhile, Hercules performed the remaining labors and said that he had very little left. Taking active action, the young goddess of resurrection began to plant mint in the underground kingdom. Valida seriously asked her if something bad would happen if the goddess Persephone found out about this. The girl said that she had nothing to fear from her mother. Her father had been very kind to her lately, so he would not get angry if she pissed off her mother a little. The young goddess said that she had received many gifts from Hades, and now it was her turn. She didn't finish speaking because she saw a man carrying Cerberus. Rukalis couldn't believe her eyes, and especially didn't understand why someone was carrying the dog. But soon she felt a strange smell of a living person coming from the stranger. The guy approached them and asked why such little girls were walking alone, to which the girl asked a counter question, who he was. The stranger was very surprised that she really did not know who he was. Suddenly, his words reached the young goddess, in which he called her baby, which is why discontent flared up in her. Before them stood the mighty Hercules, born of Zeus and a human woman. He was suckled by Hera, for which he received an immortal body and became a great hero. But for the goddess herself, he was only the fruit of immorality. So several decades later, she continued to watch how happily the man she hated lived. Unsatisfied with the fact that he had built a happy family, the goddess Hera decided to drive Hercules crazy. Her plan was a success because the guy, without realizing it, killed his entire family, including small children. By the time he recovered, the murders had already been committed, and his friend was trying to bring him to his senses. He shook him with all his might, praying for his friend to wake up quickly, but Hercules was only able to cry. A friend told him that there was a way to wash off this crime, so he should go to the Delphic Temple right now and pray to the gods for help. Having come to the gods and repenting of the murder of his family, the guy received tasks to carry out twelve assignments, which were the responsibilities of Hera. Now he told the young goddess that he had already completed eleven tasks, and the last one was to catch Cerberus. The girl angrily lamented who he called little girl, because it is obvious that she is a goddess. Looking down at her, the guy didn't understand why this bug was blathering so loudly. Rukalis menacingly asked what the hell kind of Hercules he was and what kind of feats he was talking about. Starting to use magic, she said that the surface world was very large, so she could not know its name. Unexpectedly for everyone, the young goddess shot her magic at him, shouting that people like him should be taught a lesson once. The ball of magic flew straight into the young man's chest. He did not even try to dodge it. Suddenly, the ball evaporated, and there was no trace of her magic on Hercules, which greatly surprised the daughter of Hades. The goddess, who lived only in the underworld, of course, could not know who Hercules was. Moving towards the castle, she reasoned that, it seemed, Hermes had told her about something like that, something about a younger half-breed brother. The guy calmly listened to her story that for a man he is not bad in divine matters. He thought that she was probably a lower goddess without special powers, but she spoke so impressively about the twelve higher gods. The girl said that Zeus's fertility should not surprise her, but perhaps if he were the son of Hera, it would be more interesting. Hercules thought that, judging by the fact that she had powers, she was definitely a goddess, but he could not understand what she was a goddess of. He decided that he needed to get out of this place quickly, so he asked her if she would come with him. The young goddess indignantly asked if he was really going to take Cerberus away without Hades' permission. The guy joyfully stated that he had already received this permission a long time ago, so he was ready to carry Cerberus to the earthly kingdom. When he first arrived, he visited the god of the underworld with a question about Cerberus. Hercules told him that as soon as he completed the task, he would immediately return him to his place. Hades thought for a moment and said that if the guy could carry him away, he could take him. Now he told the girl that the god of the underworld himself recognized his powers. The guy thought that fortunately, Hades did not think that he would really carry him away with his bare hands. He said that he would return the dog as soon as he finished his business, so he advised her not to worry. Rukalis saw that the stranger was not moving at all, because there was a wall in front. Without thinking twice, Hercules said that he had completely forgotten the structure of this place, which is why he always stumbles upon dead ends. He began to stretch his hand, and the girl fearfully asked why he was doing this. 
The future hero of Olympus was famous for something else, but the young goddess did not know about it. Having run up, he directed his hand towards the wall and hit it with all his might. From his blow, the wall began to move and gradually collapse into small pieces. Everyone knew that the guy never listened to what the gods told him and did as he saw fit. In the underworld, Hephaestus built almost everything, including the castle in which Hercules broke the wall. Therefore, now the young goddess could not contain her anger and screamed that he had really decided to carve out a way out for himself. The guy mockingly replied that they had no need to look for him because he had superhuman strength. The golden maiden was delighted with his strength and gave him two hundreds out of one hundred, and the daughter of Hades was greatly dumbfounded. She screamed at the top of her lungs that he was crazy. Her scream could be heard even outside the castle, and the fairies decided that their ward was in good health. Having reached one of the halls where he could rest, Hercules sighed heavily. Unexpectedly, he saw his friend sitting on the sofa, who advised him to go pray to the gods. This was the same man who shook Hercules with all his strength so that he would come to his senses. The Sofa of Oblivion of Hades, on which, if someone sits, they will not be able to get out of oblivion until they rise. However, if a person does sit down, then you will no longer be able to get up even with force. As a result, this place becomes a curse that you cannot get rid of until your death. Hercules didn't care, so he grabbed his friend and jerked him up, tearing his butt and meat off. Of course, he did not know about this secret item because he had just come to the underworld. Rukalis began to examine the wounded man, thinking that no divine power could stand next to the hero's brutal methods. The guy was glad that his friend had come to his senses and wanted to lift the second person from the sofa, but the girl quickly stopped him. She stated that this man wanted to marry Persephone, so this conspirator could not be released. Hercules listened to her carefully and declared that he had no desire to help the enemy god of the underworld. Sitting down with his friend, he said contentedly that having saved Theseus was enough for him. Leaning on him, the guy asked if his friend had gotten into some kind of trouble, to which the man replied that he seemed to have been beaten with all his might and as if he was being tortured. The girl unwittingly overheard their conversation, and the guy asked if his friend remembered the one who did this to him. Of course, the culprit was Rukalis, who kicked these people for a long time, but his friend said that he did not remember anything. Feeling guilty, the daughter of Hades offered resurrection help and restored his face, and his butt stopped bleeding. Walking through the underworld, Theseus said that this was indeed a wonderful place, but suddenly, a black shadow headed towards him, indicating that it could smell a living person. Turning in her direction, the man was able to see her completely, and the shadow continued to say that a fresh smell emanated from him. Hercules's friend trembled and asked what kind of spirits these were and whether they really wanted to harm him. The girl looked at him sternly and said that she was a goddess and did not understand how they treated people. Theseus immediately rushed to Hercules, saying that they should go with him. The future hero of Olympus turned to the young goddess, asked her to be quieter, and asked how long the baby would trail behind them. They looked at each other with contempt, and Theseus said that his friend was a little sharp-tongued. Rukalis asked the guy if he had said everything, and wondered if he was really tired of all these eternal little ones. She added that even if he has one thousand years of life behind him, he does not dare to be rude to her. Smiling sweetly, the young goddess said that when he gets old and sick, he will crawl to her for help. All this time, Theseus tried to explain to her that Hercules saw the exit and ran towards it. Pursing her lips, she indignantly asked why he was only telling her about this now. The tearful man with regret in his voice said that she was pushing her speech. The golden maiden approached her and asked if she would really follow them forever. The angry girl said that she would chase them until she got tired of doing it. The exit was the place where the path between the two worlds is located, it was from there that a golden light emanated, which does not exist anywhere else in the underworld. Rukalis had no idea where this might lead her. All she wanted was to have no regrets and a fun first adventure in the human kingdom. In the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess squatted, biting her nails and constantly repeating that she was the first. She told her son that Adonis was hers since she was first, and Persephone stole her man. And if she were not the queen of the underworld, she would not have allowed her to even look at him. Eros looked at his mother with pity, but when she turned to face him, he saw madness in her eyes. Aphrodite asked in a quiet voice if her beloved son had finally come to her. A long time ago, the Moirai predicted that the children of Gaia, half-human, half-snake giants, would invade Olympus. Only one hero, born from the union of Zeus and an earthly girl, can resist them. So in this world, the future heroes of Olympus Hercules appeared, possessing remarkable strength.
Zeus drank wine with Hades and asked him if his son had asked him to borrow Cerberus. The god of the rising world with sadness in his voice said that he did not think that a person would be able to defeat Cerberus. The highest god told him that this was a hero who was destined to take them to war with the giants, so he was not like everyone else. Zeus already knew what Hera wanted, but pretended to be surprised that she gave him twelve instructions at once. Seeing the adult Hercules, the goddess Hera did not believe that it was he who was called the savior of Olympus. Deciding that he was unworthy of her mercy, she gave him twelve tasks, saying that he could easily cope with them. Since she knew that Hercules would be at the head of the real battle, he had to complete her tasks, which were beyond the power of a man, in order to win. Now Hades was thinking about whether Zeus was really going to just feel sorry and watch everything from the side, after which he asked if the highest god thought he was too frivolous. Zeus mockingly replied that the Moirai needed his seed, and they needed a hero, so he killed Hercules. Then he said that since such an opportunity came up, he decided to do it with the beauty. The god of the underworld said that in any case, Hercules must be warned not to get on the god's nerves while carrying out his tasks. Zeus thanked him for his concern and asked him to visit Olympus more often. Before Hades left, he added that he would provide him with such beauties that would help him forget Persephone. Returning to the underworld, Father Rukalis was very angry that some little man had taken his princess with him. Charon and Thanatos looked humbly at the floor, unable to find words to justify their actions. The carrier said that the guy told him that he had received instructions from Hermes and protection from the goddess Athena, and it was reckless on his part to put a living person in a boat and transport him across the river Styx. After listening to him, the god of the underworld said that for this offense, he sentenced him to punishment in the form of a year in iron chains. Oises tried to intervene, reminding the angry Hades of what exactly is considered a year in the underworld. God furiously interrupted her, saying that they, by inaction in such a situation, did not feel their role in the absence of his daughter. Trying to calm himself, he turned to the god of death Thanatos and the god of dreams Oneros. Father Rukalis ordered them to find the princess by any means, and for this he provided his golden helmet, which would help me catch people's eyes. At the same time, the young goddess enjoyed the beauty of the earthly kingdom along with her new acquaintances. Theseus said that he did not think that she would go outside with them, to which she responded with a question about who he took her for. Addressing the sleeping Hercules, she stated that underground everyone calls her beautiful, but he considers her just a talkative little thing, so she is obliged to show her greatness to someone like him. Looking at him angrily, Rukalis told him that when he needed her help, he would crawl to her on his knees and beg for her to just go away. Having calmed down, the girl stated that she herself had always been interested in visiting this world. Watching the trial take place, she wondered why the dead cried. She believed that they, like others, would eventually get used to life in the underworld. The dead cannot forget their earthly life. They could not throw away the things they used during life. No matter how accustomed they are to life underground, people will always miss life on the surface. Lying down on the ground, the young goddess said that it was for this reason that she went with them, even if it was impulsive. Looking up at the sky, she saw myriads of sparkling stars and thought only about how beautiful this place was. Raising her hand up, the girl decided that even if the lights in the sky did not shimmer like diamonds, they were still very beautiful. Noticing that the starry sky reminded her of her father's hair, she began to realize that her heart ached because she left without telling her father anything. At the same time, the god of the underworld was seriously concerned about the well-being of his daughter. To confirm that Hercules completed all twelve tasks, he needed to show the Cerberus king of Turin's, and then they would be considered completed. Naturally, they were still very far from Turin's, so at dawn they immediately set off. The guy turned to Theseus with a request whether he could talk about something other than legends about heroes, because he spent a long time in the underworld. His friend replied that he had been in oblivion all this time, so he did not remember anything. Frustrated, Hercules begged him to come up with something, because he was very bored. Then Theseus decided to tell him that when I first found myself in the underworld, the ferryman told him that Hades had given birth to a daughter. He then added that since then, the girl had never been to the above-ground kingdom of people. Hercules was inspired and asked with interest whether this goddess was beautiful, to which he received the answer that his friend knew that he would ask this. The guy proudly declared that jocks usually like beauties, and Theseus answered him that he was too daring. The future hero of Olympus imagined that if she was the daughter of Persephone, then her face could not be ugly. But then he remembered that she was the daughter of Hades, so she might look like him. 
Hercules reasoned that dark and menacing girls were not exactly his type, and a voice from behind answered that perhaps he was not her type. The two of them finally realized that the same daughter of Hades was traveling with them. The girl said that he should have understood this even when he was destroying the palace, because she was the only one who opposed this idea. The sad guy asked if he really should immediately understand that such a little thing could be the goddess of the underworld. Rokalis smiled happily and said that he probably didn't understand it because he was a fool. The young goddess and the future heroes of Olympus again threw sparks at each other with their gaze, after which their fists were used. Theseus tried to stop Hercules, but he responded by asking why he was only telling him this. His friend said that she was, after all, the daughter of Hades, to which the guy replied that she was not Hades himself, and besides, she did not show her powers in any way, so he did not think that she was a goddess. Just before this, the young goddess was screaming that she thought they weren't going in circles. The guy angrily replied that since she was a goddess, she could call on some spirit of the road who would show her the way. The girl suddenly had an epiphany that she could actually do this, but then she realized that they were mocking her. Therefore, Hercules now reasoned that he did not believe that there were such goddesses who knew nothing. Turning to him, Rukalis smugly declared that he should not delude himself, because when he dies, she will exile him to Tartarus. The guy impudently told her that she wouldn't be able to do anything with him during her lifetime. They again began to throw sparks at each other, and the future hero of Olympus told her that if she died, he would bury her under the root of a tree. Theseus this time tried to calm them both down, but the young goddess said that she would crush him much earlier. Trying to pry the biting goddess away from the guy, Theseus told them that they had business to do, and now was not the time to fight. He added that they needed to find out how much provisions they had on hand, and whether it would be enough for such a long journey. The fight stopped because they both realized that they had no food with them, nor any people's money. Tearing herself away from Hercules, the girl zealously declared that she had a lot of money and jewelry in her room. Hercules naively asked if they could not simply squeeze them out by force, to which Theseus clarified whether he was a thief and what his mother had to say about this. The guy raised his hand and said that after he killed Lila's teacher as a child, his mother didn't tell him anything. Then he offered to cut off the finger of the Golden Maiden so that they would have money, to which the young goddess was angrily indignant and said that she would not give even a hair from her head. Theseus thought that a heroic thief, a daughter of Hades, and even a golden maiden were a problem, but they wouldn't even be allowed into the city with such a monster. While Hercules's friend was in thought, robber archers crept up to them from the forest. The first arrow slightly grazed Theseus's cheek, but flew past, after which they were shouted to throw their weapons on the ground and give up everything they had. A gang of thieves, the Black Hurricane, mocked the fact that everywhere only Hercules were showing off. They discussed how one of them looked like the one that would make the officials go crazy, and the other looked like the one that would appeal to the aristocrats. Seeing the young girl, the robbers immediately decided that the most valuable things were standing aside. The archers talked about whether they could present this girl to the king and assumed that she was better than those whom they had sold before. Their conversation suddenly fell silent because the guy threw something at them, after which they realized that he had sent a three-headed dog at them. Theseus said that if the hero killed them, it would be bad, so he decided to intimidate them so that they would run away. Rukalis screamed furiously that the robbers should not be allowed to escape, because then rumors would spread. The commander of the robbers shouted that they should not think about the monster, but only think about money. Hercules said that there were a lot of them left, and at the same time a plan to collect money from the robbers matured in their heads. Snow white skin and a small face, her brilliantly beautiful appearance had some unknown appeal. One of the robbers thought that someone would screw the girl anyway, so he decided to enjoy her first. Theseus fought with other robbers, thinking that, of course, they had a difference in skills, but they could not win so easily against this gang. Seeing that even more robbers were descending towards them from the mountain, he tried to understand how many there really were. After dealing with several, he noticed Hercules violently killing his opponents. The future hero of Olympus completely crushed the robber's head with his club. Looking at the bloody weapon, the son of Zeus and the earthly woman cursed and said that there was too much dirt from the attackers. Theseus thought that his friend was literally in the skin of a bear, and didn't the robbers realize that he really was Hercules? Looking at the golden maiden, he asked her why she stood aside and did nothing. At that very moment, the gang captured the young goddess of resurrection, ordering the others to surrender and throw down their weapons. Otherwise, they would kill her. Hercules chuckled displeasedly and pretended that he was not at all interested in what they were talking about. 
Seeing this, the robber screamed about whether they really wanted to see her little head fly off her neck. The guy calmly noted that if they wanted to sell the girl, they would not be able to kill her. One of the robbers shouted that she was in their hands, to which the future heroes of Olympus replied that they were not very familiar with her. Theseus whispered to the Golden Maiden a question about whether she would really not save her mistress, to which she replied that she would not take action without her permission. The man puzzledly hinted to Valida that the situation was becoming very dangerous. Then, Hephaestus decided to directly ask the hostage if she needed her help. Rukalis confirmed this quietly, after which the Golden Maiden began to attack. After the answer of the young goddess of resurrection, only a few seconds passed, and Valida was already next to the robbers. She quickly grabbed the guy holding her mistress hostage by the throat. The next second, the Golden Maiden cut off the heads of all the people who attacked her mistress. Having stained herself with blood, the girl said that when an attraction to the gods arises, these thoughts become known to the pantheon. The robbers often thought about raping the women they caught, once they captured a married woman with a child. The vile people were going to have fun with her and then give her to slave traders, or worse, kill her and burn her. Seeing this picture in the pantheon of gods, the daughter of Hades concluded that these people were dirty to the very bones. The gods could easily kill a person, for example. Zeus, without even crushing lightning, was able to incinerate a person with just heat. For a goddess with the power of resurrection, killing a person is like lightly snapping her finger. Therefore, now the surviving robbers were quietly dying from being suffocated by her magic. Finally seeing her power, Hercules whistled in surprise, recognizing her as a goddess. Theseus had seen many deaths in the war, but this was the first time he had seen many people die from one gesture. Without death, there is no resurrection. So for Rukalis, death was commonplace, so much so that even a hero like him, it made him shake with fear. The man, numb with fear, asked her if this was a hereditary skill. The young goddess told him that it was like the lightning of Zeus, because he did not always use it, otherwise order would be disrupted. The girl said that the death of this gang and God's punishment would not disrupt anything. Hercules noticed them moving away from the battlefield and asked if they really just wanted to escape from the scene of the murder. Rukalis said that she did not want to meet with Thanatos because the angel of death would come for the dead and would quickly understand that it was her doing. Then she smiled sweetly and happily said that she didn't want to go back to the underworld yet, and she liked this adventure. The future heroes of Olympus, parodying her, also smiled broadly and joyfully announced that he did not like it. They began to fight each other again, and Theseus and Valletta moved on. After a couple of steps, they announced that they had finally reached the gate, thanks to which the brawl ended. The death-giving goddess of resurrection and the cursed hero Hercules will soon cause the disappearance of an entire kingdom. The girl held tightly to his neck, and when he asked her to let him go, she answered negatively. Hercules's mother is the previous Mycenaean queen, Electrion's eldest daughter. His father is a Mycenaean general, so Hercules himself was with the son of the royal family. As Rukalis approached the gate, she noted enthusiastically that Mycenae had elegant fortress walls. The Golden Maiden said that they didn't even want to break such things, and Theseus told them that, unlike the underground kingdom, this fortress was very small. For the daughter of Hades, even the palace of the underworld was just another tower. Hercules suggested that they follow him if they did not want to crash into the stone lions. The Mycenaean gatekeeper greeted him with feigned joy, asking his hero what brought him back. The guards notified the townspeople that the main hooligan had returned like a bolt from the blue. Hercules angrily asked if he really needed a reason to come to this place. The gatekeeper trembled and said that it was an honor for them that he had taken the time to visit their palace. Theseus explained to the young goddess that this man was responsible for the lion's gate, but she only thought that he looked like a mouse. The future hero of Olympus said that on the instructions of the goddess Hera, he needed to get to Tirnif, after which he ordered the gatekeeper to find him the way there. Then he added that they were also planning to enter the capital, and the poor man would prepare everything in advance. The guardian of the lion's gate could not refuse him, but asked what to do with those who came with him. Hercules quickly answered him that these were his companions, and they would get along, to which the young goddess angrily asked what they meant. The gatekeeper prepared a carriage for them, which carried the four of them and dragged Cerberus behind it. But Rukalis listened to Theseus's stories. The man told her that in the end, the lion's gate became the standard of an impregnable fortress. Looking at the girl, he asked if she still had questions for him. In the depths of his soul, he hoped that she had no more questions, but she decided to finally ask him what kind of large stone was visible ahead. Theseus explained to her that it was called a tholos, 
a domed crypt in which the Mycian royal family and aristocracy were buried. Hearing the last phrase, the young goddess involuntarily looked at Hercules and nodded in confirmation to Theseus's question about whether she had any questions left for him. Not even a minute had passed before she pointed to the future hero of Olympus and asked if, if he died, he would also be buried in this place, since he was a member of the royal family. But then she remembered that the guy said that he came from Thebes, but if his parents were Mycenaeans, then how did he end up in Thebes? Theseus involuntarily looked away from her and awkwardly reported that Hercules's parents had long been expelled from Mycenae. Rucullus was inspired when she heard this answer and asked with interest whether it was really because of treason. Although Hercules's mother was a Mycenaean princess, her husband, trying to catch a bull, threw a spear and accidentally hit his father-in-law, the king of Mycenae, beheading him. After this incident, the couple were expelled from the city, and of course, the young goddess had no idea about such details. Admired by the story of the future hero of Olympus, the girl asked if the gatekeeper was not glad that Hercules had arrived. When a city has at least one hero, his status in the country increases, although he was born in Thebes, but Mycenaean blood flowed in him. Rucalus realized that this was why Hercules reluctantly trudged to Mycenae and realized how difficult his life was. Theseus added that this is why Mycenae and Thebes have a tense relationship, because the latter realized Hercules too late and now look badly at the former. These two states are fighting daily to be awarded a hero to enhance their status in the country. The girl asked with interest why Hercules should choose Mycenae, since his parents were expelled from there. Noticing the gloomy expression on the face of the future hero of Olympus, Theseus tried to pause their conversation, saying that children are not always so attached to their parents. Their conversations were unexpectedly interrupted by Hercules himself, rudely informing them that they had become quite noisy. Turning to Rucalus, the guy asked if she was really the goddess of resurrection and not the goddess of asking questions. The young goddess became angry and in response angrily asked why he had any business with this since she was not asking these questions to him. His fist was a couple of centimeters from her face and Hercules loudly asked why the goddess herself did not know such things. He explained to her that his parents left him because he was a bully, a puppy without blood and tears. Then pointing to himself, he invited her to look at his memories and find out everything for herself. The girl relaxedly told him that she was terribly lazy to do this, and especially since there was someone next to her who could perfectly tell it. In response to his question about whether the goddesses really couldn't do anything, she touched his hand. After that, she looked at him furiously and said that she should have killed him along with those men. The incensed Hercules told her that she could not raise her hand against the chosen hero. Some time later, Thanatos arrived at the scene of the massacre and could not believe that one little goddess had destroyed so many people. His informant was with him and told him that it was probably a goddess with similar powers. Oneros took off his helmet and said that among the gods, there were those who could reincarnate into a child. The guy said that the dead say that they saw a three-headed monster. He also added that he thought for a second that Rukalis might be there because the gang had mentioned a golden statue of a girl talking. Looking at each other, the two gods immediately realized that this was exactly the one they were looking for. The young goddess displeasedly asked whether she understood correctly the question about why she could not kill the hero. Without waiting for an answer, she said that the hero was born with a special purpose. If you kill an ordinary person, then nothing will happen. But if the hero does not fulfill his mission, then the thread of fate may become tangled. The girl calmly said that all this was invented by the Moirai together with Zeus. Theseus asked if he fit the definition of a hero, to which she answered in the affirmative and added that he was an Athenian hero. The man involuntarily thought that he was not afraid of death at the hands of the goddess, and the daughter of Hades thought about whether she really looked like the one who could kill him. The carriage finally arrived in the capital of Mycenae, and many servants greeted them. Seeing the four travelers, absolutely all the servants thought that they looked very suspicious. The butler offered to find them accommodation for the night, after which he led them along the corridor of the palace. The girl reasoned that although they were going to Tirnif, they were getting good help in Mycenae. Theseus reported that this treatment was due to the ruler of Tyrrhenes and Mycenae. Two regions were simultaneously ruled by one man. He lived in Tirnif, but was already heading towards them. The man said that he was very sorry that they could not go together to Tirnif, to which the young goddess remembered that he was the king of Athens. Rukalis reminded him that the previous king of Athens, Perithios, remained in the underworld. Theseus embarrassedly noted that more time had passed than he thought, so he needed to return to Athens as soon as possible. The girl laughed and asked him to tell him how to kill the Minotaur. 
Two maids grabbed her from behind and said that they would take her to water treatments, but the daughter of Ada resisted with all her might and said that she did not need help in washing. After they announced that they had prepared a body massage with gold for her, she immediately changed her mind. Observing all this, Hercules still could not understand why the goddesses loved gold so much. The butler approached him, asked for his forgiveness, and embarrassedly said that they would not be able to take Cerberus to Tirnif. The man said that all the people refused this work, and the carriage simply broke under such weight. Theseus asked if his friend had ordered the royal family to build a carriage. The guy answered irritably that they would have walked faster if his saliva had not been poisonous. After a while, he turned his gaze down to the street, where he saw the young goddess walking through the market. Theseus explained that she said that she did not want to sit in a room at all, and that she was interested in looking at different people. Hercules was amazed by the goddess of resurrection Rucalus, who was not like the other gods. He vividly remembered how his own mother cursed Zeus for choosing her. In his own opinion, all existing gods perceived people as ants. But the daughter of Hades from the underworld, unlike other gods, even with such high self-esteem, she looks at everything through the eyes of an inquisitive child. Hercules suddenly remembered her words that she was not ready to return to the underworld because she enjoyed this adventure too much. The future hero of Olympus thought that she said in the carriage that she could not kill him, but could easily injure him badly. Theseus noticed a strange expression on his face, so he asked what happened, to which his friend replied that he was just thinking. He then pointed his finger towards the market and said that she was talking to suspicious people. The merchant showed her those same fake Hermes shoes, and the young goddess sincerely believed that her friend really walked barefoot now. Theseus watched her restlessly and asked if this was an obvious deception, to which the guy replied that she was too curious. The man ran towards the market, shouting that she urgently needed to be stopped. Hercules smiled sincerely for the first time and said that she was indeed an interesting goddess. That same night, two gods invaded the bedroom of the future hero of Olympus, zealously searching for the princess of the underworld. Oneros passed his hand over the sleeping hero and said that he was in a deep sleep. Moving his hand a little closer, the god noticed that the guy looked like he had just come out of the forest. Before she had time to finish this phrase, Hercules turned towards his hand, which is why Oneros's heart practically stopped, and the god of death noticed that the guy was definitely stronger than an ordinary person. Then he turned towards the three-headed dog wagging its tail and added that he was able to drag Cerberus on him. The god of dreams said that Hercules really looked like someone who would carry out Hera's orders. Carefully examining the sleeping guy, he said that many said that this man struck Poseidon and Helios with his arrows, to which Thanatos advised him not to talk nonsense. Oneros quickly remembered why they had come, touched the tip of Hercules's nose, and said that they should start with punishment for the kidnapping of the little goddess. First of all, he decided to see what the future hero of Olympus was dreaming of, but he did not at all expect to see in his dream many women thirsty for entertainment. All the girls were perfect and offered a variety of pastimes. Unable to withstand the influx of feminine energy, Oneros came out of his sleep and hit the sleeping man with all his strength. Long ago, it was predicted that the child of Zeus and an earthly woman would one day conquer Olympus. Therefore, the highest god chose a human girl and turned into her husband, taking his place. Thus, she became pregnant with Hercules. The parents were very frightened, but they raised the child as predicted. Over time, the boy grew up and gained unprecedented strength, and using his half-god, half-human abilities, he quickly became the greatest hero. All of Olympus was pleased with this and was even deeply touched, but the gods did not think about people at all. In the Mycenaean palace, people said that parents should give their lives for the sake of their child. This was the virtue of a parent, an unquestioning promise of love. The teacher once explained to the sleeping Hercules that every Mycenaean should know this sentence. He woke up the sleeping boy and asked if he filled out the information he said accurately. Yawning, the boy responded in the negative, to which his teacher asked if he couldn't pretend to be studying. Noticing his mother in the doorway, Hercules immediately jumped up from his desk and headed towards her. Hugging her son, the woman asked if he listened well to his teacher because she was worried that the boy was being cunning. The chaste and graceful woman Alcmen was more beautiful and wiser than all other women. Inside the fortress walls, everyone spoke so highly of her, she was even gifted with the favor of Zeus. When Alcmena passed by, people whispered so that everything could be heard perfectly. Addressing her son, the woman told him not to let himself be broken in any situation. In front of an unshakable mask, people quickly lose interest and fall silent. She was always honest with people until the dark, deep night came. After every day she tried to strangle her son, 
Deep down, she believed that he was the culprit of all her misfortunes. His mother shouted that he should have been born the child of a goddess, and she did not understand at all why she was suddenly chosen. Alkima cried and screamed about why the gods needed to use the womb of an ordinary poor girl. The woman's grip was weak, so if Hercules wanted, he could easily stop her. The boy knew that she would never give up, so he simply waited for dawn, and the woman with bitterness in her voice asked to kill her. While he was washing himself in the bathroom the next day, he was still replaying her words in his head that he was born because she had been deceived. Even as morning came, Hercules continued to hear the woman's cries in his head that he was born at the cost of everything she had. While the maids washed him, going over each scar, the boy remembered what object he received. One of the maids said that there were rumors that all these scars were inflicted on him by the goddess Hera, and added that his mother must have been very worried about him. No one could even think that his child was being tortured by his own mother, and he thought that it was much cooler to be known not as a hero raised by the torture of his parents, but as a hero who grew up in divine trials. Deep down, Hercules hoped that one day all the servants would know that Alkima was going crazy. Periodically, his mother locked him in a closet with a chain and padlock and did not give him any food. All that remained for him was the living mice that came running to him, but even at that time, he thought that the Supreme God really didn't know that everything would turn out exactly like this. Several days passed, and his mother came back for him, asking if everything was okay with him. The boy heard that Mycenaean parents would not spare their own lives for the sake of their children, but until the very end, he could not understand the meaning of these words. As time passed, when Hercules grew up, he decided to go on a journey on his own. The phrase his teacher said about his parents was still spinning in his head, but he decided for himself that it was time for him to say goodbye to this oppressive place. In the morning, he didn't say anything to anyone and set off on his journey, but Alkima somehow found out about it. Standing at the door of the castle, the woman displeasedly asked whether he was leaving without saying goodbye. The guy didn't expect to see her at all, so he was a little confused and didn't immediately understand what she was asking. For the first time in a long time, his mother was calm, saying that she did not want to give birth to him for a second. She added that she could do nothing but follow his destiny to become a hero and hers to give birth to him. All her life, Alkima hated the unfortunate fate of herself and her hero son. At their last meeting, the woman told him that since this was fate, he must become a hero. She asked him not to bend under anyone and to become a hero before whom even the gods would bow. His mother's last words were parting words in which she asked him not to become like her. The people he met along the way openly did not understand how he could show hatred towards the gods. Many sighed, looking at Hercules, who challenged the gods themselves, but the guy did not break and continued his path, which he considered correct, not knowing that the tragedy had already begun. Over time, changes began in the life of the son of Zeus. After some time, he was able to start a family. His wife asked him not to be so angry with people because they cannot do anything, because gods are absolute creatures for them. Hugging his wife, he often asked her a question about why people don't understand that they are giving their lives to some gods. It was as if trouble was waiting for the moment when Hercules would lose his vigilance behind the veil of endless happiness. It was as if someone was whispering in his ear to kill everyone, even his own family. It was the goddess Hera asking the hated child if he heard what she was telling him. She sent him madness, because of which he was unable to have a family, which will continue until Hercules destroys all his loved ones, and when he comes to his senses, it will be too late and everyone will be dead. There was something like divine compulsion in this to fulfill the hero's destiny. The goddess knew that the future hero of Olympus would not be frightened by the threat of physical suffering. Therefore, she captured his mind and forced him to kill his loved ones, and Zeus turned a blind eye to this. His friend was the first to see the sad picture of his family and rushed to help. Theseus found him cursing everything and everyone around him, including these unfortunate trials. Many said that heroes are born, but it seemed to Hercules that his fate was changing depending on the whims of the gods. So now he held the god of sleep by the throat and told him that he couldn't stand it when they dug into his head. Oneros turned noticeably blue in his hands, but could not utter a sound, but only groaned quietly. The embittered future hero of Olympus squeezed his hand even tighter on his thin neck. Bringing it to him, he explained that he would not tolerate this, especially if this someone was a god. On the day when the young goddess dealt with the robbers, the full power of her power was revealed for the first time. Hercules realized that she was still a deity, and remembered that even though many said that the gods were self-sufficient, they still turned people around as they wanted and forced them to bow before themselves. Suddenly, he saw that the girl was sitting near the rock, 
so he asked what this girl was doing. Coming closer to her, he called out to Rukalis and asked her what she was doing. The daughter of Ada pointed to the children sitting on the ground and said that she was thinking about what to do with them. Theseus decided that perhaps these people were the goods of the robbers she had so cruelly killed. One of the children shouted that if she was going to kill them, she should do it quickly. The future heroes of Olympus believed that this baby should be exactly the same as the other gods. The young goddess told the frightened children that they should not say such words. Smiling sincerely at them, she happily told them that she had no desire to take their lives. Hercules looked at her with interest, and the thought crept into his soul that she was not like the other gods. Now Rukala slept peacefully in her room and saw a deep, sweet dream. In her dream, she was surrounded by many beautiful guys who were ready to make any sacrifice for her. One of them leaned towards her so that their lips could meet in a sweet, tender kiss. Looking more closely at the guy, she discovered that Hercules was standing in front of her, asking her if she liked him. He, like the previous guy, began to approach her in order to merge with her in a passionate kiss. Because of this persistent behavior, the girl screamed loudly in her sleep and immediately woke up. The golden maiden, who was lying nearby in her sleeping bag, also woke up and looked mysteriously at her mistress. Valida sat down and asked what happened that the young goddess screamed so loudly. The girl was in a cold sweat and just muttered about how this idiot with muscles was stuck in her head. Seeing a table and a pillow fly past the window, she was even more taken aback, not understanding what was happening. At the strange sound, his friend Theseus was already rushing into Hercules's room. He also didn't understand what had happened, but he hoped that nothing bad had happened. In the corridor, he suddenly saw the young goddess of resurrection running in the opposite direction. She collided with him and fell to the floor, but Theseus noticed that she looked very joyful. The girl asked if it was really that noticeable, and then added that she had not heard the sounds of a fight for a long time. The three of them went to the side of the room of the future hero of Olympus to understand what had happened. Theseus noticed that, judging by the sounds, someone suspicious was entering the palace into the forest, so he advised her to stay behind him. Rukalis beamed with happiness and asked him if he really had a suspect. The man said that he did not know a single person who would wish harm to Hercules. Hearing this, the daughter of Hades rushed as fast as she could towards the strange sounds, saying that it was probably just a thief. As they came closer, they saw a huge gap in the wall, and the girl felt a strange feeling. Looking inside, all three saw Hercules beating the god of death Thanatos. Rukalis could not move from the picture she saw of how the gods she knew were beaten and lying on the floor. After some time, the beaten Thanatos and Oneros were able to come to their senses, and were now sitting opposite the future hero of Olympus. The girl dejectedly asked if they were really the main characters of this booth. Then she furiously inquired that the two of them had forgotten in the kingdom of people what business they had here. Thanatos furiously clenched his fist and told her that she had escaped from the underworld without explanation and dared to ask them what they forgot here. Having measured his anger, the god of death mockingly said that they were carrying out orders from her father. The young goddess could not believe her ears that the god of the underworld himself had given the order to find her. Thanatos asked if she really thought that everything would end with just punishment. He told her that the carrier was given a severe punishment of a year, being in chains. The girl completely sank when she heard about her friend Charon, and the god of death asked her if she felt the burden of responsibility. Oneros entered the dialogue, asking if she really thought that the human world was safe. He asked her if she knew how Persephone ended up in the underworld, and if she imagined how dangerous it was for the goddess to remain alone. Theseus and Valida did not dare to interfere in their conversation, so they quietly watched everything from the side. The young goddess embarrassedly apologized to them and said that she had not thought about the consequences at all. Thanatos gave her a hearty blow to the head and then told her to get ready to head back. The girls didn't like their proposal at all, so she asked again. Oneros calmly explained that it was time for her to return to her father in the underworld. In the underworld, she had everything, it was a world that was so perfect that she couldn't get enough of anything. Rukalis knew very well that one day she would need to escape from there, into the immensely fragile, constantly changing and imperfect world of people. The young goddess recalled how at the market she bought flowers that she had never seen before in the underworld. She brought the bouquet closer to her nose to smell the deep aroma of each flower. That is why she explained to the two gods that she intended to remain in this world. The girl calmly said that she wanted to learn much more about this interesting place. Oneros became very worried and shook, and his companion became blacker than a cloud. But Rukalis reminded them that we are the goddess of resurrection. She then asked them how she could live knowing only about the dead, 
because new people would constantly come to the afterlife, but she would not be able to understand them without visiting their world. The god of dreams did not believe that she was taking her duties as a goddess so responsibly. He told her about how the god of the underworld was worried about her and was waiting for her back. Thanatos remembered watching the dead, while his informant explained to him that they all died at the hands of Hercules. He added that the guy is the son of Zeus, and in terms of the number of murders he ranks second after Dionysus. That same evening he went to the mysterious future hero of Olympus, but found him in bed with a girl. Watching the love scene, the god of death blushed a little, and his companion became worried. Then he broke the silence by asking if this guy really killed hundreds of girls, either from madness or from nature. Even the gods do not disdain speculation, obscene tone and impudence, so they hasten to leave. When Hercules beat the god of death in his room, he said that the god of death was not capable of anything, after which he angrily asked what this vaunted underground kingdom was even worth. Now Thanatos told the young goddess that at first she acted as if she wanted to stay in the underworld forever, but in fact, on Olympus, she chose the upper world. The girl tried to justify herself, but he did not want to listen to her and only said that she would not tell her anything because she would not listen to him anyway. Climbing onto the windowsill, the god of death told her to act only as she herself wanted. The young goddess tried to stop him, but he no longer heard her, but was plunged deep into his thoughts. Finally, he turned around and said that he was going to work, because he could not always follow her around. Daughter Ada only had time to wave goodbye when her friend disappeared outside the window. Rokadis and Oneros watched as he flew further into the darkness of the night. The god of dreams put his hand on her shoulder and noticed that his companion had a rather bad character. He then added that she should not worry about anything, because Thanatos was simply very worried about her. Onero said that she was right, because if the goddess of resurrection does not know life and sees only death, why should this be right? The god of dreams calmly informed her that this was most likely a good opportunity for her. Rukalis sadly remarked that she would like to remain small forever, and her friend mockingly replied that she did not change in this matter. He told her that sooner or later she would have to grow up. That was a given. Oneros kindly explained to her that with growing older comes new pain, that's what they were all worried about. To his words, the young goddess replied that no one had ever died from arthrosis, but he told her that he did not mean physical pain at all. Pointing to his heart, the god of dreams said that he meant the inner pain that everyone carries within themselves. The girl noticed that Eros was okay with this, but Oneros explained to her that it was Psyche who actually went through Aphrodite's test. Then she asked a completely logical question, why the god Eros experienced pain. The god of dreams sincerely wished for his ward that she would grow up without any pain. The young goddess became embarrassed and said that she also wanted this, but she was worried about the question of why everyone was so worried that when she fell in love, who would change beyond recognition? Deciding to change the topic, Onero said that he himself would discuss everything with the god of death. She understood that she could no longer stop, because if not now, then she would never visit the human world again. After some time, the daughter of Hades indeed returned to the underworld with a certain stranger. Thanatos was the first to meet her and could not believe his eyes that she would change so much. The girl returned as a girl, in even worse condition than everyone expected. Thanatos had always been full of love for her, but that night something was wrong because his face and body seemed stony, as if there was not the slightest drop of love left in him. The young goddess's companions were moved to a new location after the butler inspected the huge hole in the wall. A stingy male tear flowed down his cheek from the realization that he had let them into the palace in vain. Relaxing on the bed, Hercules was glad that the two gods had finally left them. Leaving the room, Rukalis noticed that the peace was completely destroyed. Therefore, the butler placed all four in one room, which seemed like too much for the goddess. Theseus tried to improve the situation and said that now she could be with Cerberus. Velita asked her mistress what she would do now, to which she replied that they would go to Tirnif and think about it there. But first, they would receive a three-headed dog from Hercules. Turning away from her, the guy asked if she would really go after him, to which she replied that he should not worry, because she would only go with him to Tirnif. The future heroes of Olympus thought that last night the little one said that she was not going to return to the underworld. He watched as she defended her position and tried to prove to them that it was important to her. Hercules could not believe that there was a god who sincerely wanted to know about people. Going deeper into his memories, he clearly remembered how his mother said that he would become humanity's greatest hero, but at the same time, she stomped on his head with her shoe. The woman insisted that, unfortunately, this was his fate, and that is why she trampled on him. 
There was no noble purpose for his birth, so now he reminded everyone how much he hated the gods. Sitting on the sofa, the future heroes of Olympus insisted that they were self-willed, narcissistic, and twisted people around as they wanted. The girl interrupted his tirade, unexpectedly declaring that the speaker was absolutely wrong. Rukali said that the gods are indeed capricious, because in the underworld she met many gods and knew this firsthand. She noticed that she had heard these same words a million times about someone completely different. Twisting her fingers, the young goddess began to list that she had heard the words wayward, narcissistic, twist people as he wants, and is obliged to release his anger. Grinning smugly, she angrily noted that it reminded her very much of Hercules himself. With these words, she made him think that he really was no different from the gods he hated. The next day, Theseus advised the young goddess that if a stranger calls her to go with him, then she should not do so and should not kill or attack him. Rukalis did not listen to him at all, but angrily declared how he could not tell her that he was leaving for Athens the next day. Valita added that they were disappointed in him, and the man tried to somehow justify himself to them. Looking at Hercules, he unobtrusively asked him not to quarrel over trifles. The girl noticed that he was worried just like his mother, to which the man answered her that he was worried about those with whom they would cross paths. The young goddess looked at him mockingly and told him that it was time for him to go, after which she sincerely thanked him for being with her all this time. Then she walked towards his back, loudly saying that now he would receive payment for everything. The goddess of resurrection used her magic to completely heal his wounded butt. Hercules remembered that it was because of him that his friend had only one half of his butt. Now Theseus could not take his hands off the soft spot and tearfully thanked his savior, to which she replied that he had quite juicy rolls. The girl smiled sweetly and reminded everyone that she had long said that she was the goddess of resurrection. The man cried with happiness and thanked her heartily for the complete healing of his body. Leaving in a carriage, he shouted loudly for them to come to him if they ever found themselves in Athens. During their endless lives, the gods love people and go through their loss, but even so, there remains in the world the only person with whom the god develops a special relationship. Hercules rudely informed her that when Theseus built a temple in her honor, she should not be surprised if it was in the form of a priest. After some time, the young goddess was indignant about whether they would really walk on foot, to which the future hero of Olympus said that they had destroyed the guest room so badly that they would not be given a carriage. Looking at the map, the girl said that they didn't have that far to go and decided that they could get there in one day. After looking at the map, the guy explained to her that maps are drawn on a reduced scale, so the distance may seem close, but in reality it will be completely different. Indignant at him, Rukalis did not look at her feet at all, so she tripped over the first protruding roots of a tree. Before the collision with the ground, Hercules managed to catch her, pressing her tighter to his body. Returning her to Earth, he said that he knew that this could happen to her. Trying to save her mistress, the Golden Maiden sadly said that she was glad that the young goddess did not fall. Looking at her fallen friend, the girl, puzzled, asked if she was okay, to which she replied that she wanted to rest a little. The guy didn't pay any attention to them at all. He was bothered by the fact that this time, the young goddess seemed a little heavier to him. He involuntarily remembered her words about how much he was similar to the gods he hated. Rukalis, of course, said that she said it with passion, but these words stuck in his head. Hercules again felt a divine influence, which told him that the young goddess saw a side of him that he himself did not know. Intuition reported that he could just swing his fist and the girl would be carried away with one blow. An invisible spirit warned him to be careful with her because if he was fooled by her smile and kindness, it would become his weakness. In other words, it will be a danger different from anything he has encountered before. The obsessive thoughts were driven away by the young goddess's question about why he suddenly looked at them to which he ordered them to go faster. The last of Hera's twelve tasks, to take Cerberus away from the underworld and bring him to the Tyrinfin king Eurystheus, was finally nearing its end. Entering the palace, the daughter of Hades noticed that this place was really close and looked more expensive than Mycenae. She assumed that everyone recognized Hercules, so the guards did not even come close to them. The guards trembled and whispered about whether this was really the famous Hercules, and he really brought Cerberus with him. Watching them, the girl said doomedly that all this looked a little problematic. Then she asked the Golden Maiden how many times they heard concerns about their companion, to which Valida replied that they heard this for the thirteenth time. Without noticing Hercules stop, the young goddess flew into his back, screaming about why he stopped. The future heroes of Olympus did not answer her, but only again sternly called her petty. After thinking a little, he asked her, 
When she gets Cerberus back, will she really immediately go to the underworld? Rubbing her bruised forehead, the girl wondered if he really hadn't heard what she was talking about before, and explained to him that she wanted to look around on the surface. Hercules continued to move on, at the same time asking her if the young goddess had thought about where she wanted to go. The guy wanted to offer to accompany her, but unfortunately, they had already approached the royal hall. Hiding behind the door, Rukalis enthusiastically asked if this was the Tyrinthian king, to which her companion replied that since he was sitting on the throne, that meant he was a king. Approaching the royal throne, the young goddess saw that the king had huddled in a corner and was shaking with fear. At the same time, in the underworld, the goddess of pain and anxiety, Oisis, compiled a to-do list for the return of her ward. Holding the parchment in her hands, she saw the god of death himself crawling out of the bushes. Thanatos was very weak, so he asked her in syllables to call Hermes to him. God knows who came, treated his wounds and bandaged his injuries well. Hermes reported that Oneros was also being treated on Olympus, so he wanted to bring him the medicine himself, but he beat him to it. The completely rewound god of death did not delve into his words much, but only looked mysteriously into the distance. God knows, he clung to Thanatos's wing and feignedly asked why they treated him so cruelly. The god of death clarified whether Hermes should be killed, to which the guy replied that he would finally recognize the ordinary Thanatos. They were watched by Oises, who well heard the words of the god of news that he already had a stern muzzle, and when he had no face, he looked even more terrible. The wounded man thought that Hercules was a complete fool, because he was constantly causing some kind of trouble. Remembering it, he thought that such a big fight was too much, and this time he did a lot more things than usual. In any case, even though he was a hero, the future savior of Olympus was still a mortal man. Thanatos thought that even if he ends up in Elysian, he will still end up in the underworld. Hermes at this time was talking about how a man like Hercules was able to defeat the right hand of Hades. Hearing that the god of news had finished treating his wounds, Thanatos sincerely thanked him for his help. Hermes rushed to tell him the news that Aphrodite had been up to something lately. He said that a couple of days ago, Eros briefly visited them in the underworld. The guy reported that he was carrying the rotting body of a man with him and was looking everywhere for Rukalis. Oisis began to eavesdrop quite brazenly, and Thanatos asked his doctor to repeat what he had said. At the same time, the young goddess met with the king, who was hiding behind his throne and babbling that all the tasks had been completed and they could leave the throne room. Through the eyes of King Eurystheus, Hercules looked like a fierce, unbridled hunter, ready to kill everything in his path. Because the task ended so quickly, the young goddess felt the futility of their journey. Now she could ride astride her Cerberus, so she gently hugged him and said that he did a great job. Hercules noticed that the girl was very happy about her dog, to which Valida explained that they had been close for a long time. The guy said that they had been next to each other throughout this journey, but the Golden Maiden said that it was Hercules who always walked next to him. She added that she hoped to see a more noble king, to which the future heroes of Olympus replied that the goddess Hera chose him because he was obedient. At one time, he thought that he could get everything with his own hands, not knowing that he could not take anything into these hands. The goddess of fate decided his life for him, and Hera twirled him like a faithful puppet. Hercules did not own anything himself, not even love, so he decided that he was no longer afraid of any divine tasks. Walking through the forest, he thought that all the errands were completed, and he did not know what he would do next. The girl seemed to read his thoughts, so she immediately asked what he would do now. The guy looked at her incredulously and said that he wasn't thinking about anything in particular. Sitting on Cerberus, the young goddess suggested to him that since he had not come up with anything, they could take a walk together. The joyful Rukalis hovered over him, waiting for an answer to her question, but he stood in a stupor. As Hercules was about to answer, he felt a golden arrow rush past him. He thought quickly and managed to intercept her before she could hit anyone. The young goddess carefully examined the arrow, knowing deep down that it belonged to Eros, but the arrow suddenly evaporated. The son of the goddess Aphrodite sat among the trees and fired the next arrow in their direction. Rukalis tried to stop the golden arrow with her magic, completely forgetting that the power of a goddess could not do this. The girl fell unconscious on her Cerberus. Hercules was quickly heading towards her. Eros knew perfectly well that she would fall in love with the first person she saw after being hit by the golden arrow. Her companion approached her first, holding her close and asking if she was okay. Having opened her eyes, the daughter of Hades was looking somewhere behind Hercules, so he asked her where she was looking. Eros attacked him from behind, so that the young goddess would not inadvertently fall in love with him. Having pressed Hercules to the ground, 
God said that he was interfering with the plan of his beloved mother. The guy bared his teeth angrily and said that he would be attacked on the sly quite often. Then he grabbed Eros by the wing and pulled out the feathers from him with all his might, saying that he had eaten people like him. The future hero of Olympus was so angry that he violently tore out one entire wing. This punishment seemed insufficient to the guy, so he hit the god in the face with all superhuman force. Hercules could not understand why he was trying to protect his companion from an attack like hers. He continually hit his opponent in the face, and each time his blows became stronger and stronger. His bloody slaughter was interrupted by a beautiful girl rising from the ground. The Golden Maiden looked from behind in surprise at the changed body of her mistress. Rukalis matured sharply. You didn't ask anyone to explain to her how it happened. Hercules was speechless, but still gave a powerful slap to his opponent. Walking ahead, the future hero of Olympus asked if Aphrodite was really that crazy. He was angry that she was able to make the young goddess fall in love with the old man because she refused to resurrect her. Daughter Ada watched lovingly as her new lover moved slowly. Hercules did not understand his feelings and thought that the first arrow still hit him, which is why he was so angry. He turned back and asked Eros, since he considers himself her friend, why he was able to do this. The son of Aphrodite explained to him that he could not do anything because he had once sworn over the river Styx, so he could not disobey his mother's words. A joyful Rukalis walked ahead of everyone, humming songs to herself and carried in her lover's arms. Ero said that he also wanted someone to stop him from carrying out his hated assignment. He said that for this, he took the old man to the underworld, where he tried to show everyone that he was up to something. The guy said sadly that no one, not even Thanatos, whom he was counting on, reacted to this. Hearing a familiar name, Hercules told him that the one in whom he hoped could not move. When he asked why, the guy mysteriously explained that it was better for him not to know about it. Trying to change the subject, he asked if there was a way to bring her mind back. Eros sadly reported that if everything was so easy, then the Golden Arrows would not have such fame. Hercules suggested that we could simply replace love with hatred, because that would be enough. Having decided to act, the future heroes of Olympus demanded from the archer a quiver with his arrows. Trying to grab what he wanted, the guy said that he had to make Rukalis throw away that damn old man. Eros stopped him loudly, saying that he was also hurt, so he should be well aware. Grabbing a quiver of arrows, the son of Aphrodite asked him if he too wanted to be shot with a lead arrow and hate the daughter of Hades with all his heart. Remembering the day when his golden arrow pierced the heart of the god of the underworld, the guy said that she was not the first among the gods. Hades at that time did not understand at all what had happened to him and why such passionate feelings flared up in him. The first person he saw was the goddess of spring Persephone, who had the imprudence to greet him. Once upon a time on Olympus, Aphrodite sipped nectar with her son and told him to look at the bored face of the god of the underworld. She said that he never got any inspiration from his visit to Olympus. Then the goddess of beauty decided to see what would happen if Hades felt love for the goddess of the earthly world. She was interested in the question of whether this would make him go out more often, visiting the higher gods. Aphrodite's joke turned out to be successful because the god of the underworld began to go out to the above ground world every day. If it weren't for the golden arrow, Perhaps Persephone and Hades could have gradually fallen in love for real. The lovers, even after learning that it was because of the golden arrow, ultimately refused to shoot the lead one because it changed love for hatred. Eros asked a rhetorical question about what kind of crazy person would do this. He suggested that perhaps Rukalis would think the same as he did and would not dare to take a lead arrow. The guy admitted that he took an oath on the river sticks and could not shoot her with a lead arrow. Eros sadly said that he knew perfectly well that he was a fool because he promised to fulfill any request of his mother. He said that since he knew Aphrodite well, he assumed that she would simply bring another old man and order him to do the same. All this time, the princess of the underworld eavesdropped on their conversation, after which she furiously loomed over the culprit of her growing up. The girl looked angrily at Eros, putting into perspective what she had heard, that they had also done the same to her father. Rukalis angrily asked him if he really thought that since she fell in love, who could not destroy him? After her threats, she gave him a couple of rather serious blows, which caused the guy's cheek to swell even more. Sitting astride him, the girl reasoned that even a puppy picked up on the street knows what mercy is, but she could not understand who was the one who helped Psyche escape safely from the underworld. Ero sincerely asked her for forgiveness and promised that he would definitely repay her. The daughter of Hades pressed hard on the remaining wing and said that he was obliged to repay her. She said that it wasn't even funny that it all started with Aphrodite's banal curiosity. The girl recalled her childhood, 
her mother's hatred, threats, and several broken destinies. The goddess perfectly remembered how Persephone diligently tried to strangle her at every opportunity. It was artificial love, and the child born from this love did not understand whom he was supposed to hate. Rukalis decided not to pay attention to it anymore because she suddenly saw her first love. She was overwhelmed with gratitude that she was still able to find out what love suffering was. Noticing the surprise on the elder's face, she gently attacked him, saying that he could not pay attention to her words. Hercules could not look at this calmly, so he tore her away from her lover and asked what she was going to do next. The girl seriously said that she was going to bring the elderly man back. Turning towards the future hero of Olympus, she asked if he hadn't heard that Eros had kidnapped him. The guy noticed that this problem should be solved by the kidnapper himself and asked why she was doing this. Hugging the old man, the goddess said that in this case, it is necessary for Eros to take Cerberus back to the underworld. Seeing the indignation on the culprit's face, she looked at him angrily and furiously asked if he really did not want to fulfill her request. Hearing that the guy was ready to do this, Rukalis again picked up the old man and continued forward. Hercules did not stop and asked her what she would do after returning everyone to their places. The girl in love gently explained to him that she would stay with her lover and look after him, because she loved him. At that moment, it dawned on the guy that no matter how old a person was, he could not reject such a beauty, because he would not be able to take his eyes off her. So now Hercules silently watched as she happily headed into the underworld. He suddenly realized that his companion had not even invited him to go with her, so he wished her a good trip and headed in the opposite direction.